seniors, equity and opportunity. We welcome you to the second scheduled public hearing of the Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Advisory Committee, which the legislature established this past summer. My name is Andrew Woods and I serve as the chair of the advisory committee. And I am pleased to be working with a highly experienced staff and team. And at this time, I would like to ask our advisory fellow and primary administrator, Dr. Pina Bialano, to do an advisory committee roll call, followed by acknowledgement of special guests. Thank you, Chairman Woods, and welcome everyone. Uh, Deborah Davis, Mothers United Against Violence. See her connecting there. Dr. James Doddington, Yale New Haven Hospital. Present. Welcome. Ebony. Yes, yes I'm here. Hi, Deborah. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Uh, excellent. Uh, Ebony Epps is excused. Dr. Uh, Kyle Fisher, the Javi. Present. Leonard Jihad, Connecticut Violence Intervention Program. I forgot you're so new. Dr. Charles Jandro. This is so new. Hartford Hospital. Michael Makowski, State Department of Public Health, Injury and Violence Surveillance Unit. Here. Welcome. Uh, Jackie, Jackie Santiago is excused. Carl Schissel, Connecticut Hospital Association. Dr. David Shapiro, St. Francis Hospital. Dawn Spearman, you are not alone. Jeremy Stein, Connecticut Against Gun Violence. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Colleen Violetti uh, from State Department of Public Health Injury and Violence Surveillance Unit. And Andrew Woods, our chair. Hey, President. All right, thank you, Pina. Okay, at this time, I would like to acknowledge uh, special guest, Senator Marilyn Moore, who has been a champion and sponsor of this advisory committee. Uh, Dr. Stephen, Attorney Stephen Hernandez, Executive Director of the state's nonpartisan commission, who serves as the administrator of this advisory committee. Also, I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Pina Violano, who serves as the advisory fellow and primary administrator and Thomas, the CEO administrator. We also would like to acknowledge and thank CTN for the live coverage of this hearing and all of the advisory members, our committee members. Additionally, please note that this hearing is also being streamed on the Commission on Women, Children, Senior Equity and Opportunity Facebook page, and um, in addition to CTN. At this time, I would like um, we can, Dr. Not Dr. Um, Senator Moore, we would like to open up with a few comments perhaps from you, Senator. Did I become a doctor? Uh, you, yeah. You got <laughs> quite a few on this call, so yes. Thank you, Andrew. I just want to welcome everybody. You've got a really uh, good agenda here and you've got a lot of people signed up. Um, State Senator Marilyn Moore representing the 22nd Senatorial District. I've got a lot of people have signed up. I want to hear their testimony and how important the work that you're doing and to guide the work that you're doing because we're only going to solve this by community and not one organization or one person has the answer. So Pina and Andrew, really thank you. All of the members of the advisory, I thank you for staying true to this and, and moving forward and also the support staff. So I look forward to hearing the, the testimonies this evening. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, thank you, Senator. And I believe um, Stephen Hernandez, not sure if you were able, I know you were traveling, uh, Mr. Hernandez. Okay. So 
Tina and TJ, if he does um, show, please uh, let me know that way I can acknowledge him and uh, get him in for a few words as well. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like for the public uh, who may not know what our charge is, under the statute Public Act 2135, this advisory committee has five mandates. One is to consult with community outreach organizations, victim service providers, victims of community violence and gun violence, and gun violence prevention, community violence and gun violence researchers, and public safety and law enforcement representatives regarding strategies to reduce community violence and gun violence. Number two is to identify effective evidence-based community violence and gun violence reduction strategies. Number three, identify strategies to align the resources of state agencies to reduce community violence and gun violence. Number four, identify state, federal, and private funding opportunities for community violence and gun violence reduction initiatives. And number five, develop a public health and community engagement strategy for the Commission on Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention. In order to do, in order to assist the advisory committee and fulfill these mandates, our purpose today is to hear from you. As members of the general public, grassroots organizations, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, and local violence prevention professionals. We welcome your ideas about what lessons and lived experience you believe the committee needs to reflect upon as we develop recommendations on how to reduce community and gun-related violence. We welcome your full oral testimony, as well as written sub-submissions by the close of today's hearing. But in consideration of the demands on everyone's time, our ground rule and only ground rule today is that each speaker limit comments to three minutes. Today, we have over 60 individuals who have signed up. And so we would definitely be adhering to the three minute time limit for courtesy and to get as many folks to be heard as possible. So thank you in advance for bringing your insights to this important fact finding effort. And at this time, I'd like to please ask that you when, you, when we do get you up to state your first name, your name, full name, and the organization that you are representing or affiliation if you are representing an organization. Um, for advisory members who may have questions, by all means, please raise your hand in the, uh, the chat or, the, or uh, beside your name, and we will recognize you in that order as well. And so at this time, our first up for, the, um, for testimony is Mr. John Torres, Executive Director of Bridgeport Carib Youth Leaders. Mr. Torres. Good evening, Chairman Woods and Senator Moore and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to provide my testimony. My name is John Torres and I'm the executive director of the Bridgeport Caribe Youth Leaders. The organization especially called Caribe and um, Caribe is a grassroots youth development organization serving annually over 700 youth ages five to 21 and nearly 400 families. Our objective is to provide youth with role models, mentors, and support necessary for them to remain in school and have a clear pathway to college, vocational program, or workforce upon graduating from high school so that they can become contributing citizens in their community. During our 18 years of serving the community, we have seen a pattern that is alarming. The number of gun violence incidents involving youth under the age of 16 is directly impacting other youth and the community. On a recent field trip with some of our scholarship, uh, high school scholarship recipients, the, the conversation of gun violence came up as a classmate of some of the participants was killed. I asked the group how they felt of what was going on. And one of the participants Tiana, who is also an honor roll student, stated, it is scary because it's getting closer to me. I know three people my age involved in shootings. And her experience is becoming more common with our youth and families. And both are living in fear of being killed by stray bullets or being caught 
and crossfire of violence. In 2020, Bridgeport had 21 homicides involving guns. And that as of September 30th of this year, there have been 14 murders with many involving guns and youngsters mm -hmm. under the age of 16. Caribe, we're a member of Bridgeport's Youth Gun Violence Task Force under the leadership of Mark Donald of RISAP. And together we are working with other members of the task force to create a safe environment and provide the resources and hope to Bridgeport youth that will help will offer much needed physical, mental, and social support so they can be the best version of themselves and not become another statistic. I believe the state needs to invest more in preventing community gun violence that disproportionately impacts inner city communities and increase funding focus on intervention and prevention programs. According to the Giffords Law Center, gun violence is estimated to directly cost Connecticut taxpayers at least $90 million annually. Mm. Investing more in community-based intervention gun and, violence pre and, started. and prevention programs will not only save lives, but also reduce the trauma afflicted on those communities. And it would save, obviously, taxpayer money. For that, I say thank you for the time to share my thoughts. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Torres. And, um, any questions from members at this time? Okay. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Torres, and we appreciate the, um, look forward to seeing the, the written text and adding that to our report as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is um, Mark, McD Mark Donald from the, uh, the Executive Director of RISAP in Bridgeport. Mark? Give me. Going once, going twice. Okay, we'll roll down to the next person. Dr. Charles Jundro, Harford Hospital. Going once, going twice. Okay, down to the next person. Dr. Dwayne Smith, CEO of Housatonic, Community College. Good evening. My name is Dr. Dwayne Smith, CEO of Housatonic Community College. I want to thank Senator Marilyn Moore and Chair Andrew Woods and the Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Advisory Committee for the opportunity to provide testimony. I speak from both professional and personal experience on the impact of gun violence. I first arrived to Housatonic Community College in July of 2020 from St. Louis, Missouri. A month later, one of Housatonic scholars was murdered a victim of gun violence. A year later, we lost another Husatana scholar to gun violence. In March of 2020, my eldest son, who was an entrepreneur in Kansas City, was set up for a robbery. He was shot multiple times and left for dead. He was able to recover, but still has permanent scars and a disability. He was fortunate. Many victims of gun violence do not make it. There's a myriad of reasons for gun violence and just as many solutions promoted. As a lifelong educator, I want to focus on the role of education. I do believe that a strong educational foundation has a power in transforming lives. Statistics bear this out. Studies suggest that there's a strong correlation between those individuals who are in the criminal justice system and their lack of education. African-Americans, specifically African-American men have the highest among any group to be impacted by firearm homicide and is most acute between the ages of 20 and 34, providing educational opportunities should be the linchpin of any serious movement to the decreasing gun violence. Community college can play a significant role in this endeavor. A majority of black and brown men who enter higher education come through community colleges. Community colleges are nimble enough to provide various types of programs that attract diverse learners, especially those who are tempted to turn their lives around. I will offer that providing an economic incentive through education makes a difference. At Housatonic alone, it is estimated 
that the last three graduating classes will earn a combined career income of close to $2 billion. That is incredible considering that a majority of these graduates are the first in their family to graduate from college and are from low wealth families and communities. Those communities that are many times caught in a crossfire of gun violence. Partnering with pre-K-12 educational system in creating a seamless educational pipeline can certainly make a difference. Community college can also serve as a partner in hosting robust discussions, symposiums and conferences and providing workable solutions to address the nihilism, hopelessness and lack of opportunity that leads to the reckless state that our communities are enduring. As CEO of Houston Community College, I can speak for my colleagues that comprise of Connecticut State Community College that we are eager to provide the necessary opportunity that can make a difference in the lives of all of Connecticut citizens. Thank you for allowing me to offer my testimony. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. S uh, Dr. Smith. Um, fellow members, any questions for Dr. Smith? Okay, Dr. Smith, thank you again for your testimony. And we look okay. forward to um, receiving your written testimony as well. Have a good day. Okay, I believe we have um, Mark Donald. Mark Donald, right there. Okay, go on. He just logged on. Yeah. Hey. All right. We may have to come back to you. Okay. Um, at this time, Joe Thomas, a uh, community member. Going, oops, going twice. All right, rolling on. Uh, Ms. Kim Washington, Mother's Demand Action. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, first and foremost, I am the president of Mothers Demand Action, a nonprofit organization which assists families of Greater New Haven, Hamden, who've been affected by gun violence. I am here today to give you my testimony, a personal testimony. Gun violence is actually increasing, not just in the, our inner city, it is also coming to our suburbs. It is a worldwide issue. Uh, we do need help from the federal and the state government. Also, um, I am going through gun violence right now myself. This is a very, very touchy situation what's happening with me in my personal life right now, but I do not mind sharing this story. I am going through it emotionally, psychologically, and mentally. Um, I live in the town of Hamden, Connecticut. And unfortunately, I'm in the process of selling my home. I have been living out of a car, living back and forth at my home, which was shot up two, a year ago. Um, I do not blame any police officers. I do not blame anyone from the state level or the federal level. I blame the people in the community. We all have to take a stand and stand up for our what is happening in our communities. This is very, again, very emotional for me because again, I have been living in a home for over 40 years. Unfortunately, now I need to sell my home. Some nights I am not even able to sleep because of gun violence that is in coming into my town. Yes, we do have increased police officers who make rounds in my neighborhood. I have um, some days I go to work, some days I don't go to work because a lack of sleep. 
I think everyone on this panel knows someone who has been affected by gun violence. I know now how it really feels not to have a child to lose, but to lose a whole, I would say, just a generation that's going somewhere I'm not sure. So I'm in right now, I'm in survival mode. I need to do what's best for me. And I'm also doing what's best for my community. I could be a captain of a block watch. I could be that nosy neighbor. I could be the person who works with children at a high school. But gun violence is still affecting me. It's not just affecting me, but it's affecting all my community members, my neighbors. I never thought at the age of 51, I would be going through this. There are some people here on this uh, panel who probably wouldn't even believe it, but it is affecting me today. Ms. Washington, yeah. uh, yep. I'm just going to end it as, 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 as that. Thank you so much for allowing me to have my testimony. No, thank you, thank you, Ms. Washington. And I'm disturbed and distressed, distressed to know that you're living up under these conditions and, um, and like many others and so thank forth. You. And that's another reason why we wanted to hear from, from folks like yourself who are impacted and continue to be impacted by violence in our communities. Um, I know that Pina also has your contact information. I know yeah. following this um, call tonight, I would definitely want to reach out to you as well. But I see that we have a few members who have their hands up as well. And so, um, and one is, which is uh, Jeremy Stein. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, for giving your testimony. Um, I too am um, really sorry, you know, that you're facing these circumstances, um, and I, I will be reaching out to you as well. Um, I, I wanted to, um, I, I, I wondered if you could share with us, because I think it is important um, for people to know some of the amazing work that you have been doing in your community, um, some of the amazing work that you have um, done over the summer, and, and just um, if you could tell us a little bit so that we can you know, so everybody can, can share of that, of some of the work that you've done, you know, some of the rallies, um, the work that you've done with the police and community meetings um, and organizing your community to try to provide a safer place um, for people in Hamden to live. Um, if you wouldn't mind just elaborating on some of the things that you've worked on over the past year, that would be very helpful to this committee. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, yes, I've worked with... Uh, a woman by the name of Marlene Pratt. I thought she was gonna be up here tonight. She is the director of the Botanical Garden in New Haven. It's a garden that um, has over 750, I believe, names of the children who have passed in the city of New Haven by gun violence. Um, I do assist her on a lot of different projects. Um, I'm also a Hamden police commissioner. Um, I work with the Hamden PD. Um, I also do some work with Albertus Magnus College um, to prevent gun violence. Um, I'm, I'm only one person, but I do have a mouth. I do have a voice. Um, I have been working since 2013. Um, I, I'm just, I, when I see that there's something wrong, I try to put myself out there and try to help. But now um, I'm going through it. Um, like I said, a lot of people, they don't even know. But when it comes, now I know how some mothers feel and how some children feel who talk about gun violence daily. Um, I might start tearing up, but you guys need to understand the fact that until it comes to your door, until it knocks at your door, you will not understand. We can support, we can do everything we can, but until it hits your doorstep, that's the real, real thing. That's the real deal. And so again, like Jeremy Stein says, I've also done stuff with Jeremy too. Um, I've done stuff with Leonard Jihad. 
I've done stuff with Celeste Fulcher, who's on his panel. Um, again, I'm only one person, but I try to do the best I can. And again, this gets a little emotional for me. Um, I'm not going to stop here. Um, I don't wanna move out of the town of Hamden. I've been here, I've been a Hamden resident for probably over 40 years. Um, but I definitely need to get to a safe spot myself because it doesn't feel good when you have to go to a doctor's office and get medication just to go to sleep. And I'm going to end on that note because I'm, I'm not going to go over three minutes, which I probably have already been doing. But um, thank you again, everyone, for listening. And I appreciate this. And thank you very much, uh, Pina, for allowing me to come here today. Thank, thanks again, Ms. Washington. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we have Barbara Fair, community member. Hello. Um, I want to thank this committee for having this, uh, this event, this conversation. My name is Barbara Fair. I was born and raised in New Haven, um, actually now live in West Haven. Um, as a mother and a grandmother and a licensed clinical social worker, and a person who has fought many, many, many years um, on social justice issues. Um, I, I'm just glad to be here today and hope that uh, I can offer something um, that can make a change. Um, first of all, I think we have to recognize that uh, violence can erupt in any community, any community where people are living in poverty, hopelessness, attending low uh, performance schools. Uh, they're exposed to child abuse, neglect, and, and, and um, all kinds of social inequity, and just don't have a sense of things are gonna be good, that they have opportunities to be on, on a, uh, in, in, a, um, in a safe environment. Because um, one of the most important things about um, any human being is to, to have a sense of belonging and a sense of, of safety. And I think that's missing a lot in, in our communities. Our communities, uh, where you're seeing a lot of the uh, violence, need the same thing that suburban community need. Those kids need the same thing. And we're not focusing on that. Too many times we look for police to solve these problems and police are not the solution. And until we can recognize that and start realizing we have to provide resources for our communities, resources to our kids, give them hope for a future, make them feel safe. Until we can do those things, these kind of uh, things are gonna continue to happen. Um, we look for police to solve and then be, you know, we have the legislators who have the tough on crime narratives. We have detention centers and prisons which just they breed violence and, and uh, antisocial behavior. And yet these are the things we look to. We have programs around that we're funding millions of dollars that threaten kids. When kids are not feeling like they belong and they're hopeless, um, coming up with programs that threaten them uh, prove not to be useful. And we can see we have those things now in our community. We have the gun buyback events, all of those mm -hmm. kind of things. But we see the results of that. We, we have to stop investing in things that are not really bringing any kind of results. Anything that we come up with must be have some kind of results-based accountability. We cannot continue to do the same thing that we've been doing over and over again and expect a, a, a different result. So um, I would just like to offer until we're generally invested in interrupting what's occurring in our communities today, until we actually see our children as um, and valuable people and show them in, in, in deeds, not just in words, that they matter. Until these kind of things happen, all the hearings and conversations and, and programs, they're not gonna help us. So I, I think um, that's what we have to start looking at more and more. How do we provide resources to uplift our children as opposed to thinking uh, law enforcement is gonna do the job for us? And I wanna thank you for um, listening thank to me tonight. Thank you, Ms. Fair, as well. And I have a question, but I want to first see whether there are other members of our advisory committee. Okay, see you none. Ms. Fair, as a licensed clinical social worker, we talk a lot about therapy for especially boys and men of color, girls of color and women of color. 
and especially in relationship to violence reduction, prevention, and dealing with the after effects, the trauma, traumatic experiences our community faces. As a licensed clinical social worker, what kind of challenge do, a, what kind of position of color, what kind of challenge do you find yourself faced with and your colleagues that are seeking to, or even work with youth and young people of color? Um, for, for me, the, I think the most um, challenging part I, I have in doing this work is that people don't, I mean, I talk about these things that our kids need and people really don't focus on that. They focus more on law enforcement being a solution. And so um, as a clinical social worker, uh, which was the best part of my career, it was working with young kids and, and listening to them, not just look at the behavior, but look beyond the behavior, what is causing this behavior? And we don't spend that much time on what's causing the behavior. And a lot of it's untreated trauma over and over and over again. And the only solution to that trauma is to get make uh, stricter laws and lock people away. And that's not helping them. That's just breeding more violence and more feeling like I don't belong, I'm not important. So until people really seriously look at our, our children as children like you do in all communities, we are going to continue to have this problem. They're going to continue to pour all this money into law enforcement when that is not the solution. And I just want to mention while uh, I see Jerry, Jeremy up here, um, years ago, um, I was working with CAGB on Connecticut Against Gun Violence on a red flag campaign. And I tried to bring that to New Haven. And what that campaign did, it brought attention to when someone is shot, we should not only be looking at the person, focus on the person who did the shooting, but what about the person who provided the guns to these kids? And we never really picked that campaign up in New Haven. And so to me, that's a, a huge piece because when they did, uh, you know, originally start looking at where the guns were coming from, it wasn't from kids going into other communities stealing guns. It was people like straw purchasers who know kids couldn't get guns and they would sell them. I've heard too many times living in New Haven about people um, bringing guns into our communities and sell them to our kids for the profit. And many times because they had drug problems. We're not looking at any of that. All we wanna look at focus on the kids behavior and lock them up, throw away the key. And we have to stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, mm -hmm. Fair. Okay, um, we're gonna go back to Mark Donald. Right, Sam. I, Mr. Chair, um, I believe he stepped off. He said that he had to get off. He was going to try to come at the end of the hearing and come back. Up. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. The next person up is Adam Yagalov, staff attorney for uh, Right Direction Homeless Youth Advocacy Project. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Adam Yagaloff. I'm an attorney at the Center for Children's Advocacy here in Hartford. Um, our office, including myself, works with young people who are victims of crime and young people who are perpetrators of crime. Um, my testimony is going to be based off of our executive director, um, Martha Stone, has an op-ed in the Hartford Current on August 9th. So I would just refer people to that op-ed. Um, well, we've heard over the past few months in terms of juvenile justice reform, criminal justice reform, is we've heard that we need more programming. Um, and I'd like to discuss that here today and I'd like to second that. Um, what I'd like to say is that it's our feeling that we don't need more programming for low risk kids. We find that Connecticut is doing a good job of diverting young low risk offenders from the criminal justice system. What we're seeing though is that for high risk kids, um, we are seeing a lack of programming, a lack of adequate programming. And I'd like to address that briefly here today with some specific, um, some specific programs that we think would be good. But before I get to that, I think programming is important for two reasons. Number one, as Ms. Fair was saying before, programming is important because it helps to address some of the underlying issues that are causing gun violence. The second reason programming is important <laughs> Programming in and of itself is a way to address gun violence in our communities. What's, what research has shown and what our work with young people shows is that too much free time is one of the number one causes of violence and criminal activity in our communities. 
I would love if my high risk clients were overwhelmed with programming. I wish they would say to me that I have too many programs. I can't, I can't keep up. Will you please go back to court and ask them for, to lessen what I'm doing? Instead, what we're seeing in Connecticut is that there's not enough programs within our uh, cities. Um, there's not enough creativity in our programs to meet kids where they're at in terms of getting programs that they're interested in. Um, there's not enough, and we don't see enough effort to find and cultivate the existing programs that we have within our, our city. So for example, our violence organizations, we hear that sometimes our violence organizations don't meet the standards that CSSD or other, uh, or um, the Department of Corrections or other people have to use those programs. Well, why can't we be working with those violence programs to make sure that they are meeting our, our what, what is required of CSSD and others? I'd just like to briefly point out four programs that we think are really important that could really help reduce violence moving forward. So we've worked with CSSD and we'd like to compliment them on their work of introducing pretrial services for young people. What we're finding is that young people are arrested, they're released, and then it takes months for them to be entered into programs. And I'm speaking with you because, uh, because I believe we need to do more on uh, gun control. Listen, we've made some tremendous progress. <laughs> We all remember the horror scene, look. And it goes well beyond that, right? We still have a lot of violence out. Thank you. So I'd just like to briefly point out four things. The pretrial services, getting young people into programs from the day that they're arrested to make sure that they don't have the second and third arrests that are gonna get them into the adult system that are the most serious crimes. If they could get their programming as soon as they're in the system, that would be very important. Increased reentry planning. What we're finding is that when young people are released from incarceration, their, re their planning for reentry is very minimal. They don't have programs set up, and so, what they're, and so they're released into the community with too much free time. Um, credible messengers. We'd like to promote credible messenger models so that when young people do have free time, they can go to people who have experienced what they're going through, who have experienced the crime and getting back into the community, and they can learn from those credible messengers. And the last is a restorative justice framework so that young people can meet with their victims in a, in a way that's formalized and so that they can put efforts into making amends into understanding how their activities are affecting others in their community. So these are four programs that we think are important that Connecticut's not doing its best on right now, but we think in general, programming for young people in Connecticut is very important to reduce gun violence moving forward. Thank you. Hey, thank you very uh, much, Mr. Yagalov. Um, any questions from our members? Advisory members. Okay, uh, Mr. Yagalov, I do have one question for you, and that is the uh, committee, as mandated, is to advise the Public Health and Human Service Committee of the Connecticut General Assembly about whether or not there is support for the establishment of a new commission um, that will be responsible thank you. for coordinating funding and implementation of evidence-based strategies that aim to reduce street violence, street level violence. In your experience, would you recommend a committee, would you recommend such a committee to be formed to tackle this issue? I think so. I think we should all be looking at um, ways to reduce gun violence and ways to implement public health policies in our community. If that's gonna to lead to more discussions on programming for young kids and the ability to get them out of the incarceration system and into things that are gonna make our communities healthy, then yes, we would support that. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. All right, um, Jeremy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Adam, thank you for testifying today. Um, I had a, a quick question. So um, the youth that you see, I'm assuming that these are all um, youth that um, are mandated as part of, like they're already in the criminal justice system, correct? No, I, I think, no, I would say that um, I do, we do see a lot of youth in the criminal justice system, but I think part of my testimony going to free time is that we do see young people before they hit the criminal justice system, right? When the uh, truancy problems start happening, when um, they drop out of programs that they had previously been involved in. So we find that this issue of free time, it hits young people in the beginning before they start committing crimes and it follows them through the entire system. 
Do you um do you also I'm assuming that some of the the your clients um are, have been directly impacted by gun violence. Do you see also see a need, you know, to have services set up um to to address some of the aftercare issues that they may be facing, uh, you know, having been um uh, victims of gun violence um, or survivors of gun violence. Absolutely. And just briefly, you know, Hartford has a youth violence prevention intervention work group that they're now setting up. And as part of that, they're looking for ways to help victims of crime uh, with their mental health issues, the trauma issues to get forward. And what I'll say is that often victims today are perpetrators tomorrow and perpetrators yesterday are victims tomorrow. So this is an overlapping group of people that need the same services and that need the same ability to um, increase their mental health and other things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Adam, for your testimony. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Ms. Henrietta Beckman, Mothers United Against Violence. Good evening, and thank you for having me here to speak, Senator Moore and Andrew, thank you. Um, I have been a victim of gun violence. My son was killed in 2002. And um, that's how I basically became and joined Mothers United Against Violence. It was due to the fact that my son was a victim of gun violence. Gun violence didn't just become an epidemic today. Gun violence has been an epidemic throughout our cities. Um, our mothers and our families have suffered. They have been traumatized. We have so many children who have been left fatherless in our cities. So um, it's just that, you know, when I have to speak, I always have to think about my son and that the fact that he should be here and he shouldn't have been a victim of gun violence. But we have to work together, all of us collectively, to put an end to gun violence. We may not put an end to it, but we have to stop it because there has been too many <clears throat> of our young people who have been losing their lives and these mothers who have been suffering heart attacks, strokes, all kinds of illnesses due to the fact of being traumatized from the fact of losing their children and their loved ones. So at Mothers United Against Violence, what we do is um, we offer some, some solace because you know, when a mother, another mother hears the fact that you know you've gone through what they've gone through, then that kind of like. It just does something to them, it, you know, because, oh, that person really can support me and they know exactly what I'm going through. So those things are some of the things that help our families get through the trauma that they're facing. And also, um, we need more resources in our community and we are the ones who have to solve our own problems. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Ms. Beckman. Okay. Any questions from our members? Okay, thank you, Ms. Beckman, for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we're gonna to go to uh, Dr. Charles Jundro from Harvard Hospital. Once and twice. Okay. okay. At this time, we're going to go to Reverend Henry Brown, Mothers United Against Violence. Reverend Henry Brown. Mothers United Against Violence. Okay, hello, I'm here. Hey. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Andrew Woods and Marilyn Moore and the rest of the committee. Thank you for having me here today uh, to offer this little brief testimony. Uh, I'm here to say that, you know, 
uh, for 20 plus years that we have been advocating against gun violence here in Hartford, Connecticut, and that we have seen it all. And the one thing that really uh, sticks out is that we are living in an unders underserved community uh, where people are over often overlooked in their plight against gun violence. As Mrs. Beckman stated, we all have been preaching a long time now that uh, gun violence is an epidemic. It has been a public health, health crisis here in Hartford for years and of course in Connecticut. So the one thing that we do here in Hartford is that Mothers United Against Violence, we have seen the blood on the streets. We have all these visitation with the hospital of victims or victims that have lost their life. Over 600 people have died in this watch that we're on now. And the greatest thing about it is that often overlooked is the fact that these people in this community don't have the proper funding to allocate things among these people that need to be delivered for them. We are here talking about healing, restoration and deliverance. And the only way we can do that is you got to, the money has to be poured into these communities and empower these families that they can live again, that they can get beyond, you know, after they lost their child to gun violence, that that's another life that they can pursue going forward. You know, because our community is often overlooked uh, as uh, like, not like the suburban community. You know, we see that when things happen in the suburban community that they allocate fundings to those families, to those victims, and they move on with their lives. Well, that, what we are asking for here in our community is the same thing. Look at us like we are human beings. Look at us as we deserve that we, that we demand things now. We can't keep asking and we don't have. So if you want to look to curbing this gun violence, the one thing that we have to look at is that you have to take into contact that these are people that we're dealing with. We are living people that, and the families are devastated when they lose their children. Uh, uh, Chairman Wood, you know for yourself, you've been on the street a lot of time. You, you have been on the street, like we have cleaned up blood on the street where victims have lost their loved ones. And a many a time, a lot of that blood is left as reminders to these families that, you know, you lost your child here. And to me, that's sort of a message that people just didn't care about the loss of life here in Hartford. So I'm here today uh, asking this committee to look closely inside of our community, to look at our youth, look at these families that are directly impacted by this violence. Some of these family members never had any uh, counseling to address these issues, uh, this trauma. So if we're gonna do anything to change the perception of gun violence, we first have to be intimate with the families and the people that are directly involved by this and go forth. I, I, I heard this mother say that, you don't know what it feels like until it comes to your doorstep. Well, listen, we've been to this doorstep over 650 times. We know about how devastating it is for the mother or family to lose their loved one. So going forward, if anything, that I would just like to see that the state would start paying more attention to the undeserved community, underserved community here, not only here in Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, and any other community of color, because every life matter. And until we get that concept that every life matter and that we start investing into every community equally, we're gonna be here talking about a gun violence epidemic for the next 20 years. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you very much, Reverend Brown. Um, other comments from, or questions from our members? I have one for you, Reverend Brown. Okay, Reverend Brown, Earlier, I posed the question on whether or not there is support for the establishment of a new commission that will be responsible for coordinating funding and implementation of programs and services. In your opinion, is that a commission that we too should be looking at here in the state of Connecticut? Yes, ab absolutely, uh, Chairman Wood, absolutely. Uh, until we start looking at it in that aspect of it, we're gonna be lagging behind all other communities throughout this country. I think it's a wise choice. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, sir. And, and, and thank you for your testimony and all the work that you and members of Mothers are doing and have been doing for quite some time. Thank you, Chair thank President. You, have a great day. You too. Okay, at this time, we are next up is Deborah Davis from Mothers United Against Violence. Okay, can you give me just one moment? So I'll change this here and and I'll be right there. Okay, great. Okay, and let's start the video. Okay, thank you so much. And to our Senator Marilyn Moore, thank you so much for really all of the work that we know that you've been doing, even to get us to this point of where we're at. Um, it's so important to hear 
all of the support and the work that everyone is doing. Thank you, Chairman Woods, uh, Pina, thank you so much, and the entire um, commission. I, I wanted to echo uh, really what everyone else has been saying, but my uh, comments will start with a, a um, case in point. In 2017, 39,773 Americans lost their lives to firearms. And from 2008 to 2017, there were 342,439 deaths by firearms compared to 374,340 motor vehicle deaths. So since 1968, 1.625 million Americans that have died from gunfire more than the accumulated American deaths from all of the wars since the country's founding more than 200 years ago. Public health data shows us what, what can happen when individuals contemplate unhealthy actions fostered by loose and easy accessibility. And so most recently, a lot of the public health data did show that at least in 2017, 40,000 Americans lost their lives to firearms. So this is an epidemic. This is more than an epidemic. And as a, um, a, a member uh, of a uh, frontline worker in Mothers United Against Violence, we are charged with making certain that our communities, the underserved communities are definitely, definitely prepared and armored up in order to make certain that they have the kind of resources that they need. But one of the areas that I definitely wanted to focus on is the mental health. The mental health area is an area that we have lacked in our families and in our communities for a long time. The mental health has gone unnoticed. And so when we're walking and we're in the community, we notice that there's undiagnosed mental health and trauma. And so the trauma really is that uh, it, it, it sort of quadruples itself at so many different levels. And so what MUAV does we actually work with that family from the beginning through the hospital trauma, through their, uh, through their completion of the, of the funeral services, and then through the criminal justice system, which is really important because every level there's trauma. And since we are working and on a day-to-day -day basis with trauma, we know that this is a public health crisis, but this is not just a public health crisis. I heard people say education. I heard people talk about the fact that we need to have a, a strong and stable juvenile justice uh, system in place. And we really do, and it needs to work. We need to have good diversion programs. That's so important. But more importantly, we need all of our workers, Department of Ch Children and Family Services. Everyone has to lean in in order for this crisis to come to some kind of halt. It is not going to be over until we get into the front of it and begin to diagnose every area where we have ills of the community. For a long time, all of those areas, had we, we have been impacted by it. That's mental health, lack of resources, educational resources, every area that you can think of. And this is why I believe firmly that it's going to take the major collaborative effort of all the departments and all the part partners to come together to make sure um, that we make this commission work and the effort thank to prevent gun violence. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Thank you. You've reached your time and, I, and, and we are Appreciate your commitment and, and strong advocacy on this on this matter. Are there any other questions from our members? Okay, hearing none. Thanks again, Ms. Davis. Okay. Okay, uh, Dawn Spearman, you are not alone. Oh, Lord, wait a minute. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm at work. I'm trying to um, find a space in here. Um, hi, my name is Dawn Spearman and I'm from Yana. You are not alone. Um, I'd like to testify today on behalf of um, my city, my families, uh, my community. Um, I've been working throughout the city since 2010, working with families that's been affected by violence in and around the city of Bridgeport. Um, one thing that I've noticed and I've grown to see in the city of Bridgeport is 99% of the families that's crossed through um, Yana that we've 
touched and helped, they've all reached out to the police department when their children start spiraling out of control and looking for help. Um, we have no resources, no help whatsoever. When I say they reached out to the police department, they reach out to the police department, go to the police department, they're told we don't have any, uh, they didn't commit a crime, they're too young, there's nothing we could do. Only for them just to get on the next phone call to come down and identify your, your child's body or a collect call from your child. This is from the ages of 11 to 16. This is a systemic problem that we've been having for a very long time. It's coming from our youth now. They've taken the resource offices out of the city of Bridgeport. We have no resource offices where they used to come and call us and tell us that our children are not in school. So now we don't know that our kids are in the basement um, being initiated into a game. Okay, so we don't know all of this. So then when we get our kids start spiraling and we get up nervous, then we go to the police department. The police department tells us, oh, there's nothing we could do. They didn't commit a crime. I've had mothers call the police department, call DCYS try to report themselves just to get some help for these kids, but there's no help to be gotten. I've walked in, we have a juvenile, um, a juvenile justice center in Bridgeport, downtown Bridgeport. I've walked through there a number of times. In that juvenile justice, um, justice system, none of our children are in that juvenile place. We have kids from East End, South Berry, and everywhere there. My question is, why isn't our kids in here? The answer I got was Bridgeport doesn't have a contract with them. So our contract is straight from 11 years old, either you make it to prison or you die at 16. Now, a couple years later, now we're going through the, situ situ the situation where the kids get caught with a gun. If they're up to a, up to 16 years old, they get a, taken down to the police department, take their gun, call their parents, and their parents pick them up. Miss Miss Spearman, Miss Spearman, I getting we we got you at time right now. If um, I, I, all right, well, well, I said enough. It, it, like I said, we need more something more than recreation and things like this. We what we need is some place where when these kids are spiraling out of trouble, getting into trouble, we need these kids to be taken somewhere. At one time, we had a long lane. I'm I'm not asking to have kids taken away like that, but if our kids can't be controlled. They need to be taken somewhere where they're made to get an education, where they're made to get uh, mental health so that they don't come out here as monsters. Thank, thank you very much, my sister. Okay, any questions from our advisory members? For Ms. Spearman. I have one question. Oh, right. Yes. Um, Ms. Ms. Spearman, how long have you been on the front line and on the ground floor working? Um, since 2000. Uh, 2010, 2011, 2011. And how many families have, have you actually um, supported during that time? I don't, I honestly, I don't even, I haven't even counted because I'm, I'm, it just, it happened so, so much. It's so overlapping. I just have, actually, I have no record of it, but I mean, I can have them to be, back me when it comes to yes. this. Yes, yes, okay. All right, thank you for that powerful testimony. Thank you very much, Ms. Spearman. Ms. Spearman. Okay, at this time, uh, Carol Dorsey. She's uh, provided uh, written testimony <laughs> instead. Okay, great, thank you, Tina. Um, next up I'm is- I'm sorry, Megan. Andrew. I'm yes. sorry, I'm sorry. She is here, she's here. Yeah, she's here. Let me just uh, rename here and put, put her in here. Okay. All right, come on. Um. Hello. Hello, Ms. Dorsey. Yes. Thank you for allowing us to come and talk. My name is Carol Dorsey. I'm a mother, grandmother, great grandmother. I have uh, adopted children. I have stepchildren. And I also am a mother of a son that was killed. He's, um, he died in 2010. 
on the Solomon Avenue in front of a church. And he was left there. And I thank God for Mothers United Against Violence because they came to my rescue at the time. I really needed help and they came and they supported me through everything that I had to go through at that time. And I was living in Virginia, so it was really rough for me because my son was killed here and I lived in Virginia and I had to um, come all this way. And I didn't even know what to do because I was like in shock. I had no idea where I stood, but Mothers United was there for me and they helped me to go through everything that I went through. They were very supportive. Um, and I've been with them now for the last like, five, six years. And um, we have lots, they, la they have lots of things that they do for the community. Um, we have uh, given out grocery for the elderly. We've done um, lunches and breakfast for the homeless. We have a, a, a circle of compassion where mothers meet once a month and they, um, they sew, they um, type in classes. We have um, knitting, we have counseling for whoever needs it. They're there with us, they support us, they go to court with us, they do whatever is needed. And I'm just thankful that I had them at the time that I was really in need. And I'm just glad for an opportunity to talk to y'all. I wanted to talk about the guy that was talking about um, having getting to the children when they come out of juvenile. I think we need to get to the children before they get to juvenile. I don't think we should wait until children go to jail to try to help them. We need to help now. We need to. We need our children to have some place to go now. Now, why they before they get to the point that they have to be put in in a place like a juvenile place before they can have somewhere to go, we need it now. We need recreation centers. We need parents and people to take and stand by these children. And I mean, not grown children. Like she said, from 11 to 16, that's that's real. We can catch them earlier than that. If we could, it might be a better. We just need some support. We need help. And thank, so thank. I just thank y'all for allowing me to talk. Okay, thank you as well, Ms. Dorsey. Any questions from our members? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Dorsey. For your testimony. Okay, Ms. Uh, Freddie Graves. Community member. Hi. <laughs> can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Graves. All right, um, um, my name is Freddie Graves and I'm with Mothers United Against Violence. I've been with it ever since the inception when um, Henrietta Beckman, my niece, son, son was murdered. And um, through the years I've been in and out of the organization and I appreciate the fact that they are there to help the community. And I also like to put some responsibility back on parents. I think that it starts in the home and we, we always talk about saving children, but we have to save the parents because that's where the children live. They live with their parents. And I think that we need to do a little bit more, be a little bit more proactive with dealing with parents. And um, I also think that, um, you know, when parents see something wrong in, in the household, if your kid got a gun in the room, you need to be able to do something about it, not wait until they use it. So my whole thing is about being proactive and, you know, getting the help, the organization um, being funded to um, facilitate some programs. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Graves. Hey, any questions from our members? Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Graves. Okay, You're next welcome. up is our Carmen Rodriguez. Okay, 
Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Rodriguez. Hello, everyone. So I'm, my name is Carmen Rodriguez, born and raised in Hartford, um, single mother of six, grandmother of nine. I just lost my oldest son in August to gun violence in Hartford. Um, so my testimony is just towards the Mothers United Against Violence because I've never used any of the other programs I don't know about. Um, without the Mothers United Against Violence, I have would have not known about any of the resources to, for the um, grief counseling for the kids and um, the moms and I. Um, we would have not known about any of the resources and the programs that um, they do help with. So one, they helped me with emotional support because that's was the first thing that really needed to be stepped up to. We have grief counseling for my grandkids, which he left five children behind. So now I got to step up, be grandma and daddy. So we needed all these, all this resources we could get. So as far as the Mothers United Against Violence, we need all the resources and all the help we could get. Um, also, they have they provided so much stuff for our family and our um, time. Of need. Um, they provided uh, clothes for the kids for the funeral because we were like, we were so lost that we didn't know what steps to take in order just to give my son a, prof a proper send off because we couldn't even afford a burial. Um, they helped us with the victim advocate, the referrals for uh, different programs and different things for the kids, the child tax credit. Um, because we actually really did need all these services. Um, without my newfound family, Reverend Brown, Ms. Dorsey, Ms. Davis, Ms. Beckman, I would have totally been lost. And I think I probably would have went towards the, the negative instead of keeping up with the positive. You know, because when you lose, you don't really think about the, the positive. You're like, revenge is your first action that comes to mind. So with my new family, excuse me, with our new family, we have to support them. We have only three people that work here because we don't have the services. We all volunteer, but then what? We still need all the resources we could get. They need all the help they could get. We have so much gun violence in the city. My son was, it's been 15 months. And since then it's been more than 10 people passed away. Kids, leaving behind more kids. We need the services. We need programs for these kids, after school programs. Like when we were growing up, we had the Y, we had the boys and girls clubs. We had all these things. We still have them now, but we don't have them for the programs for the teenagers. The ones Ms. that Rod need to be off the streets. Ms. Rodriguez, I hate to cut you at this time, but you reach time. Okay. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Good you know, evening, thank, everyone. And, and thank you very much for your testimony. Um, questions from our advisory members? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Okay. Next up, Janice Hill. Ms. Janice Hill. And once. And twice. Okay, Sonia Rosa. Sonia Rosa. <laughs> Sonia Rosa. Going once, going twice. Okay, Miss Vanessa Williams. Well, good evening. I am affiliated. Um, First of all, my name is Vanessa Williams. I am affiliated with Mothers United Against Violence as a participant. A participant. I am also a victim of gun violence, but I am not here to be a victim, but rather to use my situation to raise awareness about gun violence prevention. Community grassroots organizations that are providing essential services and solutions right here in the community where the impact of violence is most prevalent. 
Mothers United Against Violence encourages us to stand together and to be united and not be silenced into the walking dead. They have been supportive throughout the whole process of shock to grief, recovery, and to action. Mother United Against Violence is more than a program, it's a family. Anti-gun violence programs are working. It's just, a not, it's just not enough support, despite the investment. We must continue to use and employ individuals with the same lived experience, credible messengers, people who know the neighborhoods and the relationships. Gun violence is, is beginning to be embedded into our cities. The scale of the problem is so large that no one program that focuses on individuals can solve the issue. Mothers United Against Violence have shown success in empowering us to use our voices to bring attention to the victims as human beings. We, are, we as the mother that's most impacted by the violence and the devastating responsibility of burying our kids and the duties of, of caring for our children left behind. Mothers United Against Violence is a resource for us. We have to double the investment. Look further into programs that identify high risk that is likely to pick up a gun to solve a conflict. We know those people are difficult to reach. The mothers know who they are. That's why it's important to employ people and fund programs in the community where violence is occurring. The key is resources and funding and awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have perfect timing, uh, Ms. Williams. And, uh, any questions from our members? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Williams, for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, Linda Spence, community member. Linda Spence going once, going twice. Okay, uh, Damari Bowens, Rita Harper Youth Leadership Academy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Damari Borns, and I'm a member of the Greater Hartford Youth Leadership Academy at Hartford Communities That Care. Hartford is moving backwards in progress. The system that was set up for us to fail is doing its job at maximum capacity, and our people continue to be blinded by the endless cycle most were born into. The Black culture's legacy is being torn apart by the subculture of violence. We cannot move forward if we do not address the many issues at hand that stand in our way of change. We need to rehabilitate our people and dismantle the negative narratives behind mental health. What people witness in Hartford is something that, go, that does not go away within weeks, not even months, and probably not even years. People tend to isolate their emotions and turn to the common, more affordable action of self-medication. You can't expect someone who's lived in unlivable environments to have practical solutions. We need to increase the amount of mental health services so they are available to those who need them. Not only make them affordable, but make them known so people know where to go if the need be. Educate people with financial literacy classes. Poverty is one of the many root causes of gun, tied to gun violence. Giving people the knowledge and resources to manage their money is giving them a crucial way out of the cycle of poverty. And number three, continue to support and fund crisis intervention work to expand the reach state and nationwide. For example, the Hartford Care Response Team at Hartford Communities That Care has been a main driver of crisis intervention work and gun prevention work for well over 20 years. Fully allowing these resources to be readily available will only expand their capacity, which furthers the vision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Damari, for your testimony. Um, are there any questions from our members? We have uh, Mike Makowski. Um, Damari, um, you mentioned that community members uh, self-medicate. Um, uh, what are the um, substances that they like to self-medicate with? 
Um, the one that we mostly see through the data points is marijuana. That's one of the top, the top ones when you look at um, medication and the homicide rates. If you look on one of the data points that we've seen through the CDC um, was that marijuana was the top leading um, substance used and found in people who committed violent acts. So um, that also ties back into the mental health of people. So um, them self-medicating is them getting um, a way out of that trauma, which shouldn't be the case when mental health should be affordable for almost all people. Thank you. Any no other questions for Damari? Damari, I do have one. You've been a youth leader with the Academy for quite some time. What are some strategies that would, what are some programs and services that you believe young people would be attracted to in the community uh, to help one prevent and reduce violence, but also provide support and services for those that are impacted? Um. It's programs like ours, letting them know that there is a system in place for us to fail, researching the issues that actually go on. We hear about it a lot, but it's kind of normalized. So letting them know that it should not be normal and that there's actually systems inside of place that can actually help them get out of the poverty and get out of the cycle that they're in is crucial to their development as youth and leaders inside of the community, because this is the next generation, but they're not informed. They're not educated on what's going around around what's going on around them. So giving them platforms like ours, like researching the topics or going out and seeing it firsthand in the community and actually having a platform to share what they've been through is going to give them that voice and that passion that they need in order to um, step up and you know get out of that. I was with Mr. Lovejoy, Calvin Lovejoy. Um, one of the community members at BHCA, a leading driver inside of the community. And I helped him this summer, spent the whole summer with a group of at-risk boys. And all we talked to them about was um, political power and um, you know, community organizing. And through that program, we were able to help. We weren't, some, some people, weren't, you're not gonna be able to reach everybody, but the majority that you reach is the is the goal to re, to reach the most. So, when we were working with them this summer, we were able to touch the majority of them. And just learning that and being with them, programs like that, giving them the knowledge is exactly what we need inside the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Damari. Uh, we do have a hand up, uh, Jeremy Stein. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Damari, for testifying. Um, it's good to see you. Um, and thank you for, for being here and giving your, your voice. I know you've been doing this a very long time. I know you've been uh, living this experience as well as becoming kind of a subject matter expert um, on the issue of gun violence prevention. Um, I wanted to, to ask you about the mental health services that you mentioned earlier about greater access um, and, and possibly some stigmas that are attached to, to that kind of access in your community. Um, do you think that a statewide office, a commission on gun violence prevention would help to coordinate greater access to those mental health services? I feel like if we implement those services, I feel like it would benefit because that's, that's one service act that's working full time to getting the people that the, met the getting the people the mental health services they need. So if we have that system and program inside a place for them to actually be there full time to get them those services, we can actually work to, you know, fight back against the narrative of it's unaffordable. Um, giving them that affordability and giving it to the families who need it is, I feel like it would benefit the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Damari, got another question. Kyle Fisher. Hi, Damari. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate this. I think this is a really, really important thread that I'm hoping we can get into just a little bit. I know, you know, we've got a lot of people, but the mental health side, I, I feel like is so under discussed. And um, I, I appreciate uh, 
you giving us the details about people self-medicating with cannabis. Um, I like elevating too, when we know that there's lots of research in published med medical journals that shows that you are exactly correct. Um, I'd also add too that um, a lot of, there's a lot of good research too that when folks are having mental health difficulties that have experienced violence that uh, people drink alcohol as well to help them sleep at night, uh, which is not healthy, but it's a normal human being thing to do. Um, I, I'm curious on this mental health side, you know, what we know from the research is that most of the mental health illness uh, for folks that have been exposed to violence or have been shot themselves or have seen someone been shot is some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder or something similar. Um, but we know that folks in general, uh, you know, don't usually like going to psychiatrists like in the office. So what do you think would be, you know, people in your community uh, that you've uh, interacted with, what is a good place uh, that folks might want to receive those services that you're talking about? Um, I can speak for mainly youth. Yeah. With the youth, you can reach them through activities, more so physical activities. Like basketball, you spend, you see a lot of kids spend a lot of time at the Y, or you see a lot of kids inside of sports, giving them those outlets. Because, you know, a lot of schools inside of Hartford are underfunded. So um, giving them the funding and then also tying it into, hey, we do these sports, we do all that, but are you guys actually okay? Building that relationships with them so they're able to talk to you. They're not feeling like, you're just going into a room and talking to somebody I don't know. No, you're talking to your coach or you're talking to a mentor that's paired up with you so that they'll be there full time. And that's fighting against the stigma. Thank you, that's so helpful. We really appreciate you being here. Not a problem, thank you. Damari, thank you. And thank you very much for your leadership. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, next up is Brianna Brown. Brianna Brown. Hello. Hey. Hello, Brianna. Uh, my name is Brianna Brown, a member of the Youth Leadership Academy at Hartford Communities That Care. Um, coming to Hartford was my choice. I never knew anything about Hartford, and when I found out I was moving here, I was too young and new to see numerous problems happening in my community. But being here for a while, going into my pre-adolescent life, I can say in my city, I feel like Black minorities are put into cycles that expose them to violence based on environmental issues. The problem is that violence has many root causes that are serious problems in and of mental, no, in and of themselves. For example, substance abuse, mental health, overlooked mental health, and low income, but mostly normalization. By this, I mean we just allow the cycle to be continued because we live in a certain environment. We're seeing numerous problems that happen don't face us anymore. Allowing this situation just to pass on to the next generation and the generation after that would be just like how the mindset was passed on to us. According to the Connecticut Department of Public Health, during 2020 pandemic, there were 139 homicide cases statewide. Of these, 108 were caused by gun violence from January to June 21st. Uh, the number of these homicides were more than half of that in 2020 total. State officials said that 134 occurrences from 2015 to 20 or related to drug involvement and substance abuse. Violence, especially gun violence, affects the day-to-day -day lives of minorities in the Hartford community. Our generation is the future, so when we are given this mindset of normalization, many do not see the bigger picture of how bad violence is and how bad picking up a gun and the spread of drugs through our environment can be. Some ways we can deal with this is more drug interventions because people are not being educated and have misconceptions about rehabilitation, more affordable rehabs and therapy that are government insured, finding ways you can get guns off the street because they're easy to get and educating people on the resources they didn't know they have that are available to them and the needs that they have. Thank you for your time. Brianna, thank you. Thank you for that, um, for that insight, that data, but also the recommendations that you also laid out in your presentation. Um, it, any questions from any of our members?
Brianna, thank you very much for your leadership again. And I look forward to um, continuing to see you and, and Damari and the team um, continue with your leadership along these lines. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Next up is a Peel Crooks from Street Safe Bridgeport. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aquil Crooks. I am from Street Safe Bridgeport. Street Safe is a not as an organization who uses credible messengers to connect with young adults in the community and to reduce gun violence. Um, today, I have one of the young guys with me named um, Aki Johnson, who will be giving the testimony now. Uh, hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Yeah, here we go. Let's see. Let's see you. But definitely what's on my mind. Uh, at first, I want to thank everybody, you know, thank everybody for listening to really of what I got to say. So, um, there's a lot of stuff going on in Bridgeport, so much as well as, as the whole world. And there's a lot of kids out here who are looking for help and who are like losing their self. So, it's not that I say that I ask for help, but would you like kind of give these kids a guidance, you know, or, or help them lift their dreams up to, to make it out of, you know, of where they're from. And it's not like a bad way, it's a good way because for generations it's been happening like this. And a lot of kids seek to think that this is okay. and me personally, I wouldn't say like it's okay or some something like that. It's based on decision making. So I will I will want better for people just like me and make them understand that we are also human beings and we need to come together and make things better as a whole, not just a single like the world itself, like there's plenty of stuff going on in the world. Like a lot of dads going into jail and kids out here missing their parents, missing our lifetime, all that. And people don't know why. Like it's a, it's a lot of stuff that my mom tells me. Like a lot of people go through different things and they just need to learn that it happens for a reason. And, and there is a higher power there is somebody there who's always gonna lift you and and make you a better person. But that's that's whether if you is gonna make that happen. All all I need is like better better guidance to help us with pain, to help us not numb it but unnumb it. Like we're we're numb to it, but we need your guidance. Like grow like grown men, for example, they got but they go through daily life, they have problems, and they try to handle it themselves. But they, they didn't need a whole female to, to calm them down and to teach them things because men and men mind are not really fully developed. They are, but they don't know how to make their own decisions. So we have women coming in helping us, you know, with better decisions. So, and so far as y'all, like the people, the community, we need to come as a whole and make everything good. Like not not to the point where like I'm not saying where everybody, you know, got a decision, gotta make it, gotta do this right. Everybody who's feeling pain is and I'm not the only one and and I'm not just speaking for everybody else. Everybody is feeling pain and they, and they need people. Like I'm just saying for everybody, everybody needs to come around as a whole, they come talk to, talk to each other, talk to each okay. other. Thank brother. Thank, thank you, young brother. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed your first name. Aki. Akil? No, Aki. Aki. Aki, Aki, Aki. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for laying that out for us in, in, in real terms. And um, and I look forward to also co connecting with you. Uh, work with uh, a, a Quill and, and the team down there, and, um, and you're an inspiration, brother. Please keep doing what you're doing. Okay. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, any questions from our members? 
Okay. All right. Thank you both. Thank you very much. All right. Um, next up is Dave McKnight from Family Reentry. Thank you. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, I greet you all in greeting words of peace. Uh, honored to be here before the esteemed panel and the conveners of this panel. And I just want to say before I start that I've been really moved and touched by those who have been a victim of gun violence. Uh, my name is Dai Muhammad McKnight, and I'm from the Bridgeport community. And I am ashamed and I am remorseful. And I would like to say that I apologize on behalf of all those who have committed an act of violence, because as a young man, I committed an act of violence. And I was not aware that I was being socially engineered to make my own community unsafe. So I apologize. And I hope that goes a long way because I feel the pain of my community because in most cases, we harm the people in our own community. And I wanna say that we are all responsible for the youth gun violence because if we all can agree that children's minds in the developmental years are shaped by external forces, then we have to ask ourselves a question, what are those forces that are shaping our children's mind? And when we look at that, we see the underlying conditions of youth violence, poverty, deficient, very deficient educational system, where there is a total inequity between the educational system in the inner city and an educational system in the suburbs. And the educational system does not even address the needs of those who are the majority of the urban areas, which are black and brown people. It is not reflective of the people that live in that city. And also because of a lack of resources, self-hate, and as mentioned before me, trauma. And all of this is the collateral damage of oppression. And we know that America, our beloved country that we love, was founded on gun violence. Gun violence against the Native Americans who were here, who were sold guns and exploited their differences to kill one another, against Africans whose differences were exploited and were given guns to kill one another and enslave and brought here into slavery. So our country, our beloved country, was founded on gun violence. And I don't have to give you a history lesson. But until we can fix the system or heal the patient, then the best thing we can do as a quick solution is to continue to develop programs that utilize credible messengers that can go in with viable solutions to reach our young people and create resources and teach our young people life skills and nonviolent conflict resolution. This is not a problem that will end overnight but with consistent collaboration, we can reduce the problem. Now, if they say in psychology, hurt people hurt people, then let us all continue to heal people. And I thank everybody on this uh, Zoom for your participation in your own way in uh, reducing youth gun violence. But we have to continue to also not neglect to address the underlying issues. It is not a coincidence that when factories moved out of this country, that was a third source of income for people in impoverished areas. If you didn't have an education or a vocation, you could get a job at that factory and you could move out the hood, that those jobs were taken out of the country and at the same time, a new employer came in called crack cocaine. We have to begin looking at the totality of this whole picture. And I just wanna thank you for giving me your time and we all continue to do the work that we do, God willing. God bless you all. Okay. God, God bless you too. Thank you, Mr. McKnight. Okay, any questions from our members? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Okay, uh, Sharice Bacon from RISAP. Sharice going once, going twice. Okay, Dennis Broadnex. Good evening, um, panel and everyone. Um, Good evening, everyone. Uh, 
Dennis Barnex, um, outreach worker from Street Safe, also um, here on the behalf of Street Safe and uh, the team. I just want to just thank everybody first and foremost for uh, showing up tonight and, and, and appreciate everybody for the awareness that's going on with the gun violence throughout our communities. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I too suffered myself early in my teenage life to gun violence. I was shot at gun hand, um, first hand with a gun um, and also lost loved ones due to gun violence growing up in the inner city projects in Bridgeport. And I felt like what better way to bring it a, a true message is someone that they can relate to and seeing that was out there and that changed his mind and was looking to go on the right path. So that's what brought me to want to do this, uh, this work that I'm doing. Um, I seen it. I seen and I see gun violence at first hand. I see the victims as I am on hospital calls from my job at Street Safe. Every time someone is victimized through gun violence in our communities, I see their loved ones suffer as well as the ripple effects when gun violence is committed. And sadly to even say, people lose their lives on these hospital visits. It is devastating and senseless. Looking at the faces each and every time, how gun violence is destroying people's lives and our communities. The way we're losing our youth daily, rapidly, day by day with gun violence. I believe with a blessing from up above, we need more programs and mentoring and leadership as credible messengers, someone they can trust, such as Street Safe is helping to provide to the communities, to be funded, to help curb and come up with real life solutions on how we could get the, these guns out of the youth hands and every person, whether young or old, race or creed hands to stop committing violent acts through a means with guns and put something more positive and constructive in their hands and lives for the youth instead of guns, like education on violence, the trauma classes, emotional classes, <laughs> trades for the youth, which they are lacking, and respect put back in our communities to build the communities back up instead of destroying them and tearing them apart. All right, Mr. Broad, Broad next, you come to your time, sir, as well. And, um, any closing last sentence? All right, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Any questions? All right, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Broad. Next. Okay, uh, next up is Molly Duran. Molly Duran. Molly Duran, going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, Pastor Dorian Wright, pastor of the Neighborhood Church, Black Rock, Connecticut. Good evening. Dr. Dorian Wright. Good evening. I hope my internet uh, will hold it out. Um, yep, you're good. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my greatest respect for everyone and anyone on this call who's engaged in this work and I guess his internet didn't hold up. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, I'm back. Pastor. I'm back. Yep, okay, you're back. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. I'm here both as a pastor living and serving in a neighborhood disproportionately impacted by gun violence, as a restorative justice practitioner and leader of a faith based ministry, Straight Ahead Ministries, uh, working inside juvenile detention facilities and with youth on probation. Our motto is moving kids from lockup to leadership. I'm also here as a collaborator with many of you on this call. I have been at the bedside of a dying 15 year old girl 
shot in a drive-by at her sweet 16 party, and I've co-officiated funeral services for gunshot victims as young as age 12. And I have to thank you as a point of personal thank you to Mr. Woods, who's, tr who's trained me in community-based trauma response. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. I've consoled many grieving mothers, family members, and friends, and have attended more vigils besides young people than I care to remember. So I've witnessed the impact of gun violence upon our most vulnerable youth and families who often live under multiple overlapping systems of oppression. But I have also witnessed transformation inside juvenile facilities and in the community as young people feel heard and seen when they are acknowledged as fully human with hopes and dreams and strengths like everyone else. I'm repeating much of what I've heard already on this call. That's not hard to do, but it is so often that's the missing piece. Now, day in and day out, I engage with youth on the basis of what they have to offer, not what they lack, despite the trauma in which they live. My training in trauma, juvenile justice, and community development is helpful in moments of crisis, but that doesn't change systems. And in my view, unless, until we simultaneously address trauma on the ground and the systems that produce the trauma from the roots up, and I mean by that, neighborhood disinvestment, housing segregation, financial illiteracy, underfunded schools, and on the subject of schools until we completely eliminate punitive approaches to disciplines from our school systems, until we see the youth themselves as the assets they are to their communities, not the deficits they are portrayed to be from birth up, not on the basis of the risks they present, but the strengths that they have to offer, gun violence will merely ebb and flow. Just today, I suggested to a young man sitting in Hartford detention that I've gotten to know that he might consider a run for mayor in his city. A young man who's lost many close friends to violence. And you know what his response to that was? His response was, you're right, because I've seen some things. And now he's seen. And because between seeing and being seen, he's got something to offer. So until we deal with people on the basis of their strengths, and until we deal with Connecticut's legacy of poverty and inequality through a positive youth development lens, through investment and equity, nothing will change. But I do believe if we listen to our youth, we will find the motivation to change. We do have the will to change, I'm convinced. And among this group here, we can do it. Thank you for the time. Pastor Wright, thank you for your time as well. And I'm going to see whether we have any hands up for any additional questions. I do have one, but I also see that Jeremy Stein has one as well. Jeremy? Good evening, Pastor Wright. Thank you for your testimony and, and for all your work in the community. Yeah. Um, I, I, I understand, you know, you've been, you've been doing this for a long time. You, you, you also were a pastor in New York City. Um, and is, is what you're describing just a Bridgeport problem? Or do you see this as a statewide problem and the need to do exactly what you described in every city, in every part of Connecticut that experiences what you're I see about? it as ubiquitous. And frankly, having, having done training in Chicago and Baltimore, um, I see this as a problem wherever, wherever we, there's racist roots to systems. Wherever we have housing segregation, wherever we have education inequity, we're going to have this problem. I mean, we really need to take it back to the roots. And yes, it's a Connecticut wide problem. But Connecticut systems, in my view. I'm proud to be a member of a community uh, here in, in the West End of Bridgeport. PT Partners, shout out to PT Partners. We have one of our members here who is working to destroy all oppressive systems. And that's, that's the violence we need to do is against oppression. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Wright. One question, uh, in the, yes, the, uh, the question related to the establishment of a commission that can help coordinate funding and implementation of evidence-based strategies. What's your thoughts on the establishment of such a commission? 
I think if the commission, thank you for asking, if the commission is populated by people with direct experience in the community, with lived experience in the community, then I think the commission has something to offer. But if it's just top down from experts, I think it's a waste of time. We got to listen to the people who have both been the perpetrators and those who've been at the receiving end of violence in order to bridge that gap. And I think that's the basis of all restorative justice is we have to, we have to bring offender and offendee into the same place and that commission can do the hard work, I think. Thank you very Lived much, sir. Thank you very much. And I apologize for not recognizing your face. You look like you got younger and younger since I've uh, provided the training to you and your community while, a while back. Thanks again for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, at this time will be um, Dawn Stanley, Bridgeport resident. Uh, Ms. Stanley? Go in once, go in twice. Okay, uh, next up is Sally Connolly. Sally. Connelly? Yes, good evening. Can uh, you hear me? Yes, we Same. can. Great. Good evening. My name is Sally Conley, and I'm co chair of the Preventing Gun Violence Task Force at the Unitarian Society of New Haven in Hamden. I'm also a member of Do Not Stand Idly By, a program of congregations organized for New Connecticut that works nationally and locally to increase the use of safety devices on firearms. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity to hear all this incredible, important testimony. In the last five years, our Unitarian Task Force has advocated for gun safety legislation, provided educational forums, and worked on specific issues and concerns relevant to gun violence in our members' communities. We were strongly in support of the legislation that created this commission and recognized the critical need for strong and deliberate action to stem the horrific incidents of gun violence that is taking the lives of individuals, destroying the connective fabric of our communities, and creating lifelong trauma for individuals, neighborhoods, and survivors. All of us wish there were a miraculous formula for halting the violence, but it remains elusive. However, we do know that to be successful, in reducing the deaths from gun violence, there must be bold measures, sufficient funding, and proven evidence-based best practices. There is general consensus that components of stress successful interventions must include the employment of thoughtful, dedicated individuals known and respected by the communities they work in as mentors, crisis management personnel, educators, recreation leaders, and advocates as well as the use of community health teams who deal with trauma that can rapidly react in crisis situations and provide long-term essential services. But we must also recognize that without the availability of employment opportunities, adequate affordable housing, and the belief that a healthy violence-free future is possible, our best interventions won't succeed. The key to attaining and maintaining success is sustained funding, investment in an infrastructure that is locally coordinated and the support of city and state governments. It is essential that Connecticut establish an Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention as called for in this Connecticut initiative and that it be fully funded with resources that ensure the implementation of best practices and collaboration with appropriate stakeholders. Thank you very much. And again, thanks for this wonderful opportunity to hear all the testimony. And thank you very much as well. Um, any questions from our members? Thank you again. And um, at this time, we'll have Jennifer Lawler. Jennifer yes, Lawler. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening, members of the Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Advisory Committee. My name is Jen Lawler. I'm a Connecticut resident. 
and I'm here tonight to share some of my experience and perspective as a survivor of deadly gun violence. On December 9th, 2018, my life as I knew it stopped. My 25-year-old daughter, Emily, was shot and killed by a cowardly sociopath she'd been dating for three and a half weeks. It was on this day that every single part of who I was as a human being was taken from me. Trauma and grief immediately took hold and my entire life became and remains to be what is a before and an after. I don't believe I'm alone in this description and I wanna to talk to you about that today. Um, I've been listening there's a lot of talk about services and supports and where we're lacking here in Connecticut. And that's exactly the theme that I decided to go with tonight. Um, it is not okay for, I'm sorry, I got myself off track, for our state to be complacent in not addressing inter intervention and prevention because our numbers are better than some other states. I hear that repeatedly. I see legislators tweeting about it. It is very upsetting. These are the communities that they're elected to protect and serve and take care of and represent. And it is not okay just because we're doing better than some other places. It is not okay to continue to ignore the crisis here in Connecticut. Um, I've put the time in to understanding what would happen if Connecticut were to invest in prevention. And I believe the crisis has gone well beyond any of the laws that are great that we've made here because no one is immune from becoming a victim of gun violence. Tonight, I'm here knowing that I'm not someone who is impacted by regular daily gun violence the way many on this call are tonight, but I do live with incredulous grief and PTSD. And those two things are a common denominator for most all survivors of violence. Connecticut needs to fully fund the programs that we know can help while also creating additional, easily accessible resources for mental health and trauma the way many other states have done. We should all be able to agree that this crisis will not go away on its own. I want you to know that if I did not have the family supports that I do and consistent access to mental health, I am not sure that I would or could have lived through the last three years of my life. It's frustrating to watch Connecticut continue to be excited about updating train tracks and highways while we hodgepodge prevention. Our approach to prevention as it stands is not working and without immediate action, Connecticut will never be able to get ahead of this crisis. And to me, that means more and more human beings injured or killed and more people living in and after the way that I do now. It does not happen to have to happen to you for you to care. That's it for me tonight, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lawler. Any questions from our members? Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. John Dro. Chairman Woods, thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Charles John Dro. I'm an emergency department attending physician at Hartford Hospital. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and support of the establishment of a commission on gun violence intervention and prevention. Harford Hospital is classified as a level one trauma center. And as such, uh, we're on the front lines of treating patients uh, with traumatic injuries caused by violence. From January 1, 2018 through August 31st, 2021, our trauma registry consists of 68, over 6,800 patients, 224 of which were severely injured um, by gun violence. Uh, now, this includes a hospital stay of over 24 hours or more, uh, being treated in the operating suite or you know operating room, or tragically die from gun violence. So, the registry only really collects the data on the, the severely injured. Um, the registry does not include patients who suffer from penetrating injuries that are discharged from the emergency department, but. You know, as a trauma team, we're trained to quickly and expertly care for patients' physical injuries. However, we can't physically repair the traumatizing impact of the intentional injuries on a patient, the family members, or our community. The effects, the effects from that initial violent injury really reverberate through our communities long after their initial moments. The long-lasting physical injuries, as well as the emotional, financial devastation for the patient and their family cannot be understated. Furthermore, the potential for retribution and 
the, the cascading effects of that initial uh, trauma due to gun violence really reverberates through our communities and puts a compounding burden on our families and our communities. Uh, throughout co through coordination and collaboration with our community partners, uh, hospital-based hospital violence intervention programs, um, it, we're presented with a rare opportunity to address the emotional and generational impact of violence at the moment when a patient or a family member may be most receptive to support uh, during this violent event. Evidence demonstrates that it, that, that HVIP, the, the, the violence-based intervention programs, have been highly successful in reducing the risk factors associated with intentional injury and the cycle of recidivism. In collaboration with our partners at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, St. Francis Hospital, and Hartford Hospital, which I work, uh, we're working to integrate the community services um, into our emergency departments, beginning with embedding a partner um, on that trauma-informed system of care. This hospital-based partner would meet the, the patient, the families that are affected by the gun violence to identify supportive, com supportive community-based services. The connection with the appropriate community resources will improve patient outcomes by addressing social determinants of health, such as housing and transportation, food, nutrition, and other family support services. Uh, the Commission on Gun Violence Prevention would serve the important role of implementing community-based violence prevention strategies and coordinating funding. As established by Public Act 21-36, the authorization of Medicaid providing coverage for hospital-based services will significantly enhance our ex existing efforts to reduce gun violence and reduce the traumatizing impact that that violence has on our communities. Uh, the commission would also provide guidance for the training and certification of violence prevention professionals who will serve our communities. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this program. I wish during my next clinical shift on Thursday that I, that I see zero uh, further uh, violent uh, patients or patients affected by violence. Uh, I know that I will, unfortunately, um, and I wish that wasn't the case. And I really look forward to working with this group in the future to, to make that number zero moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your testimony as well. Any questions for Dr. Jandro? Okay, Jeremy. Thank you, Dr. Jandro, for being here. I know you're a busy man. Um, you know, being a public health expert, um, do you, would you consider gun violence in the state of Connecticut to be a public health crisis? I certainly do. I, I don't think there's, there's a single aspect that I could emphasize as being the most important aspect. I think um, there's so many factors uh, that are included here. It's not the patient themselves, though that's the most important part that I deal with, but it's the family members that are affected, the future um, potential of that patient, you know, and I, I, I deal with patients, so I always speak of, of patients, but um, I wish they weren't patients, right? I wish we can intervene um, at times prior to this traumatic event. Um, I wish we can have uh, these community-based community organizations that can prevent this violence, um, but there's so many factors. I wish I can isolate just one that was most important, but I think a comprehensive approach to, to treating this epidemic is really important. And we um, have Dr. Dave Shapiro. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry to, to make a comment on this, but Dr. Jandra, I can't agree. I couldn't agree more with you. As a, as a provider of trauma services over at St. Francis across town, we do partner together because we have the same problem. And to answer the question that was um, earlier um, raised, um, public health crises are everywhere. And everyone says something about what is and what isn't. If, if it wasn't a public health crisis, we wouldn't be having this meeting. We wouldn't be seeing the concern in the community's faces. We wouldn't be dealing with all the people who die, who get injured and their families who suffer every moment at the hands of a firearm. Um, so it's absolutely 100% a public health crisis. It is something that has been around for decades, as was mentioned before, and I'm just supporting the statement. So thank you, Dr. Jandro, for being here. Thank you, sir. Okay. Dr. Jandro, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, Reverend Robert Bergner. 
Thank you very much. Thanks to the committee and to all those who have offered testimony. My name is Bob Berger. I'm the pastor of Grace and St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Hamden and a co-founder of Swords to Plowshares Northeast, an organization that collaborates with municipalities, police departments, and community groups to organize and finance gun buyback programs. We then destroy the bought back guns and literally forge remaining gun parts, gun parts into garden tools and jewelry. The garden tools are then donated to community gardens, schools, and violence interruption programs. We also work with a variety of youth groups and with support programs for those returning to the community from incarceration, teaching basic blacksmithing skills and encouraging personal growth and transformation. As a former level one trauma center chaplain, I have witnessed firsthand the ravages of gun violence on our streets and of misused unsecured guns in the home. I have seen emergency department gurneys filled with young men in critical condition or worse, victims of gratuitous urban gun violence. I have accompanied parents as they made the excruciating decision of whether to keep their teenage son on life support after he was shot in the head while playing with a gun that had been left unsecured in a home. And although I don't recall encountering gun suicide victims in a country where more than half of 40,000 annual gun deaths are suicides, no doubt, several passed through the emergency department in my time as a hospital chaplain. The pathway out of this terrible situation is at once straightforward and wildly complex. At the straightforward end, safe gun storage in the home is essential so that neither teenagers and young children at play nor adults suffering from suicidal or violent ideation can have access to those guns. People with guns laying in the back of a closet since someone's husband or grandfather died or with a hunting rifle that has not been used in years should be strongly encouraged to participate in one of the gun buyback programs that now take place around our state. Reducing gun violence on our streets is more complex, intertwined as it is with educational and vocational disparities between our communities. This is where creative collaborative initiatives like Swords to Plowshares are so important, bringing together as they do diverse stakeholders and offering new vision and a new conversation about guns and their place in civil society. But neither gun safety nor community transformation efforts are likely to succeed without comprehensive coordination and guidance at the statewide level. Too often we see the fragmentation of groups working on issues like these with working on issues like these with each group working in its own silo at cross purposes with those with which it ought to collaborate. As well, large scale data collection is necessary if we are to learn why, when, where, and how gun violence is taking place and whether our prevention efforts are ultimately having a positive effect. That is why a structure like an Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention, prevention is essential if our state is going to reverse current trends and awaken from the nightmare of rampant gun violence it is now living. Thank you very much to the committee for allowing me to speak. Hey, and thank you, sir, as well. Uh, any questions from our members? Okay, hearing none. Uh, next up is Thayer Barkley. Good evening. I am Thayer Barkley. I'm the founder of Sisters at the Shore. Sisters at the Shore was born um, October 3rd, 2020, from the need to face trauma in our community. <clears throat> I put a call out on Facebook asking women, specifically women, if they were being awakened at certain periods of the night or in the early morning because they couldn't sleep. And the call was responded to by six women showing up at Seaside Park to now 1900 women around the country and in 11, in a, in 11 countries in addition to that. We, we lined the shore to silently pray and we silently pray to combat the gun violence and to deal with our traumas that we face every day. One of the things that I'm learning at the shore is that a lot of the women have not known how to, how to deal with trauma and some of them don't even realize that they are in trauma because sadly, this seems like it is normal and we have to keep stressing that this is not normal. We join each other to stand in prayer, to help encourage each other, and also direct each other on things to do. 
one of the, a couple of the things that we focus on is what is the, the women's passion? What is their purpose? What does their credit look like? Are they entrepreneurs? How can we support them? It all has to do with supporting one another. Um, the other thing is we talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome, but in our communities, it's ongoing. It's not post. It's every day we're hearing gunshots. It's every day we're seeing on the news that someone that we know just got shot and killed. And because it's such a small community in Bridgeport that a lot of us do know each other and a lot of us are related. We do not only go, we are not only in Bridgeport. Sisters at the Shore is in West Haven. We are in Stanford. We reach all over the state of Connecticut and beyond. I feel that it is important that we go and pray because we all feel that prayer changes things no matter what your religion is, no matter what your um, race is, we have to stand for something and we have to let love shine in the midst of all that we're doing. If we're not giving and showing love, then we're doing it for nothing. So again, um, that's what we do as the founder. That's what I do. I do have a nonprofit now. This, not, this did not start off with me thinking, oh, I'm going to have a nonprofit. This is what I want to do. This was a calling, a call to prayer, a call to gather, and a call to line and stand. I am Native American. Maniwakani means water is life. And that's why we go to the water and we silently, this is 20 minutes we do this on Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. to 9.20. I invite all of you to come to a shore near you and just stand with us as we try to figure this out together because we cannot do it by ourselves. I partner with East, um, Easton NRZ for food and things for, for the women that need that, Project Longevity, other partners, um, Peace, Love, and M with uh, Jen Lawler, uh, Kim Washington with her group, I know a lot of these people on the panel. We have to come together to figure this out. I thank you thank for you. your time and for this um, committee. And, and thank you, Ms. Barkley, as well. Uh, questions from any of our members? Okay, thank you again. Uh, next up is Reverend John, Dr. John Morehouse from the uh, senior, uh, yes. Thank you very much, Chairman Woods, and, and thank you uh, for having uh, us all on here. I've been I've been moved deeply by the testimony that I've heard from so many of you. Uh, as as a minister, I have officiated at uh, uh, funerals for people who have committed suicide with a handgun. Uh, I have been uh, in hospitals where I have also had the uh, unfortunate but uh, a sacred opportunity to be with those who have suffered from gun law, gun, gun violence. Uh, our congregation in Westport uh, is very much in favor of, of the establishment of this commission. We've long been uh, supporters of Connecticut against, uh, Connecticut against gun violence uh, and this issue particularly, uh, and we've strategized over the years on how we can help, how we can be good allies uh, to communities, undersourced communities who are so, uh, so much in need uh, and need other allies, uh, particularly perhaps from the more wealthy communities in, in, in Connecticut. Uh, I don't live in Westport, I live in Stratford, but, uh, but my congregation is standing by and will continue to stand by and do this work. Uh, uh, you know, it, considering the wealth of Connecticut, I think it's important for us to recognize how, uh, how regressive uh, our income distribution is. Uh, it's uh, when I came to Westport, I was I was I was completely thunderstruck by the difference between the Westport Public Schools and the Bridgeport Public Schools and how they were funded. And I've lived in I've lived in many metropolitan areas, but I I thought that this property tax system we have here is absolutely maybe the worst in the country. Um, and 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 I think that then gets reflected that uneven distribution of wealth gets reflected in how we go about dealing with this issue. Uh, I, I think that we need to put a lot more resources towards this. Uh, there's an urgent need in our state to do a lot more. Uh, gun homicide in Connecticut is up 30% since last year, uh, on top of the 50% jump uh, since 2019. So uh, we, have a, we have a community health crisis. We have a statewide health crisis. And we are not going to be able to achieve anything until we deal not only with gun violence, but to the systemic problems that cause 
gun violence, which include uh, uh, income inequality, the lack of services, uh, the ability of, of even nonprofits that are doing good work to get state funding. Uh, there are a lot, like many of you on the on the call tonight. There are many of you doing good work out there, and it 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 breaks my heart that they're not able to get the state funding they need. So I think this commission is an important first step, and I certainly am hoping to see more uh, more resources being put towards this very critical issue. And we want to stand by and do all we can to help. Uh, that concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Morehouse. Any questions from our members? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, sir. Okay, up next, uh, Nicole Matthew. Nicole Matthew. Nicole Matthew going once, going twice. Moving on, Kate. Roshman, Kate Roshman. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. My name is Kate Roshman, and I represent the Connecticut chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We are a grassroots organization fighting for public safety measures that will prevent gun violence. Connecticut has some of the strongest gun laws in the country, but with gun homicides rising, it's urgent that we do more. In an average year, 185 people die and 576 people are wounded by guns in Connecticut. Gun violence here, like elsewhere in the country, disproportionately affects communities of color and young black men in Connecticut are nearly 39 times more likely to die by gun homicide than young white men. We can't claim to value racial justice in this state if we ignore the crisis of gun violence and the collective trauma that it causes our communities. Community-based gun violence intervention programs have been proven to prevent shootings and the trauma they cause. And we can do more to sustainably fund and expand these programs, and we must. Every year, gun deaths and injuries cost Connecticut uh, $1 billion, and 60 million of that is paid for by taxpayers. As more state and federal funding is allocated for community-based violence intervention programs, Connecticut must coordinate and leverage its various funding streams to reduce gun violence in our most impacted communities. A dedicated office of gun violence prevention will ensure that we are directing funding to community violence intervention strategies in support of their evaluation, training, technical assistance, research, and programmatic needs. We need to make sure that Connecticut communities get the resources they need and a dedicated office will ensure that these evidence-based programs are able to continue their life-saving work. Thank you again for this opportunity. And, and thank you as well, Ms. Roshman. Um, any questions from our members? Okay, thank you again. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, uh, Poe Murray. Good evening, Chairman Woods and the committee. Uh, my name is Poe Murray, and I have been leading the Newtown Action Alliance since my 20-year-old neighbor killed 20 children and six educators in Sandy Hook in 2012. We work to build GVP coalitions and work with families and survivors impacted by gun violence from all corners of America to end all forms of gun violence. Deb Davis share the heartbreaking stats on gun violence in America. The NRA, NSSF, and the gun industry have recklessly pushed their guns to anyone everywhere agenda. And now more and more Americans are losing their loved ones and getting injured or getting injured by guns, particularly during the pandemic. Gun violence costs Americans $280 billion a year. And Newtown understands a human cost and a financial cost of gun violence. Newtown received over $60 million of federal and state dollars to build a new school and to provide mental health services, while communities like Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport did not. After all these years, the gun violence prevention movement and the federal government are finally recognizing the need to invest in the communities that are most impacted by America's gun problem. Newtown Action Alliance is a proud member of the Invest in Us Coalition, led by Community Justice Action Fund. Together, we pushed President Biden to prioritize federal investments for community violence intervention. We have been calling congressional members for many, many months to urge them to support the $5 billion in the Build Back Better Act. The funding is not yet secure, so we need to continue to push. Um, 
And um, $5 billion in the Build Back Better Act won't be enough to sustain uh, gun violence prevention. So we are also advocating for additional funding in the Break the Cycle of Violence Act. Last week, a group of community violence intervention advocates submitted a racial equity framework for community violence intervention solicitations to the White House. So the federal government is getting ready to distribute an unprecedented amount of federal funding for community violence intervention, and Connecticut must be prepared. The Connecticut Office of Gun Violence Prevention is needed to coordinate with the federal government to ensure that the grant making process is fair, equitable, organized, and helpful for the community violence intervention organizations here in Connecticut. As a member of the Time Is Now Coalition, we have also been urging President Biden and Congress to establish a federal office of gun violence prevention and appoint a director who should spend 100% of his or her time coordinating all the efforts to end the gun violence crisis. Colorado, Washington, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Washington, DC, New York City, Oakland and New Orleans have declared gun violence a public health crisis and they have already established their offices. And we hope to see all states and major cities do the same. Connecticut led the nation by passing the second strongest state gun laws after Sandy Hook. And now Connecticut must lead once again with community violence intervention. As a partner of the Connecticut Initiative to Prevent Community Gun Violence, we strongly urge the state of Connecticut to establish the Office of Gun Violence Prevention as soon as possible. Thank you so much. And thank you as well, Ms. Murray. Uh, questions from any of our members? Jeremy Stein. Excuse me. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Poe, for um, testifying and for all the work that you've done and continue to do, um, you know, not just in Connecticut, but around the country. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the Invest in Us Coalition. Um, I know you're on a lot of these calls. A lot of people on this uh, council are also on, uh, part of that coalition. Can you talk a little bit about um, your experience with other states or information about other states that have created this type of Office of Gun Violence Prevention and, and whether or not that is a, a viable option uh, in your opinion to be also be able to do that in Connecticut. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the most recent one that I am aware of and was uh, I in fact testified in support of it uh, was in Colorado. Um, a survivor named Tom Sullivan, he is a representative of the Colorado, uh, Colorado General Assembly now. And he led the effort to establish an Office of Gun Violence Prevention and the General Assembly uh, passed the legislation to do that. So it's definitely viable and it's needed across the country. I think all the states should establish one and then um, there should be a federal office to coordinate all the efforts um, you know, between all the states. Um, there'll be you know, billions of dollars pouring in through Department of Justice and CDC and someone needs to coordinate all those efforts and we need to have someone in Connecticut doing the same. Thank you, Paul. Thank You're you, welcome. and uh, Paul, we have another hand up, uh, Kyle Fisher. Hi, Paul, good to see you tonight. Um, Hi, Kyle. My question is really just a continuation, I guess, of what you were just saying. Um, we've had a number of folks tonight talk about lots of different strategies I heard hospital-based violence intervention programs. I've heard uh, street outreach in the chat. Um, I see that folks are talking about trauma recovery centers. Uh, meanwhile, you are talking about uh, lots of money potentially coming in from the federal government, um, hopefully crossing our fingers. Mm -hmm. um, so just taking it one step further from what you mentioned just now, um, do you feel like the state of Connecticut right now has an infrastructure to be able to funnel and organize and spend that money in an appropriate, responsible, uh, smart way? Or do we need something else? Yeah, I think we need something else. Um, and having spoken to many experts um, working on um, grants, um, it seems that a uh, federal grant process is not the most well-coordinated and easy process. And community organizations who are not in the habit of seeking um, grants will have trouble. Um, so I'm really glad that we worked with Ina Hobby um, and other organizations to create that um, race equity framework uh, for the White House. 
And hopefully they will take that framework and um, make it really easy for uh, gun violence prevention, you know, organization, community violence intervention programs to solicit these funds. Um, so yes, uh, we need a better coordinated effort in Connecticut and an office of gun violence prevention with a, you know, some type of director would be best. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other members? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Murray. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, Corey Betts. We have Corey Betts. Corey Betts going once, going twice. Okay, next up, Dr. Karen Edwards. I'm sorry, William Love Jr. William Love Jr. Hello, can uh, am I coming through clear? Yes, William Love, uh, followed by Dr. Kerry, Karen Betts, uh, Karen Edwards. All right, perfect. Well, uh, good evening, and thank you to Chair Woods and members of the committee for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Will Love, and I am the leader of the Jamboree Area Justice Network, as well as a state leader for Action Together Connecticut. As the seventh largest city, gun violence is certainly something that impacts our city. The fact that we ha only have one state-funded gun violence prevention organization is a grave disservice to our citizens and our society. I personally know that in Danbury, there is gun violence that goes unreported due to a lack of trust in the police, which also speaks to the bigger issue of racism as a public health crisis. We need to prioritize gun violence prevention in this state the way that we prioritize preventing the spread of COVID-19 because we are responsible for protecting all of our citizens and we have vastly underserved our communities of color. The gun violence prevention office we need to establish absolutely must be under the Department of Health to fully address community gun violence prevention as a public health crisis. The last thing that we need to establish in this state is more police funding for gun violence prevention. This is a public health crisis and people are dying because we are failing them by treating this as a policing issue and not a health crisis. If the state establishes an office of gun violence prevention while funding community level organizations, we can see a vast decrease in senseless deaths of black and brown people from gun violence. We can also work to help communities of color and foster good faith between the state and community leaders. Thank you again for your time. And thank you for your testimony as well, Mr. Love. Any um, questions from our members? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Karen Edwards. Thank you to the members of the advisory committee for this opportunity. My name is Karen Edwards. I live in Stanford. I'm a professor of public health and a retired pediatrician and public health professional. I'm testifying in support of establishing an Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention. As we've heard, gun violence is a leading cause of preventable death and injury and disproportionately affects people from minority, racial and ethnic backgrounds. And over the past two years, gun violence in Connecticut has really increased dramatically. So far in 2021, it's increased 30% over last year, and that's after increasing 50% between 2019 and 2020. And as has been uh, said by other speakers, um, gun homicides in Connecticut increased 53% from 2019 to 2020. And we have to realize that as many have said already tonight, gun violence affects not only those who are injured or killed, but also those who witness it, especially as children and teens, and those who live with fear of gun violence in their communities. We must do more to prevent gun violence and we have to use proven strategies, strategies that work, that involve community stakeholders with lived experience. And as with any public health intervention, preventing gun violence requires an intentional plan and the administrative capacity and multidisciplinary expertise to secure state and federal resources to fund community-based prevention strategies to successfully carry them out and to evaluate them to see how well they work. An Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention would accomplish this. <clears throat> the urgent need to address this problem 
again, requires use of strategies that are known to work. And as a physician and public health professional, I support gun violence prevention strategies that are based on high quality evidence. High quality evidence comes both from academic research and from community stakeholders with lived experience. An example of this kind of evidence-based strategy is the research-based model that has been used by Project Longevity that was uh, described in a 2015 working paper from Yale. This kind of evidence-based strategy, there could be several in a portfolio of proven preventive interventions that would be employed and organized by the Office of Gun Violence Prevention with input from an advisory council. We really can't afford to delay implementing additional comprehensive community level strategies to prevent gun violence. Children and teens are dying, they're being injured and they're being otherwise negatively impacted by observing violence in their communities. We must take action so that all Connecticut children have the best chance to survive and thrive into a healthy adulthood. We must prepare now, as has been said by other speakers, for the opportunity to utilize new federal dollars to prevent gun violence. And so I support the establishment of an Office of Gun Violence Prevention as the most effective pathway to accomplishing this. Thank you very much. And thank you very much as well. Uh, any questions, members? Hey, hearing none. Hey, thank you again. Okay, uh, next up, Kian, I may mispronounce this, Amid, Amidi, or Amidi. I'm here now, if you can hear me. I can't see myself, though. I don't no know. problem. Um, pronounce your name for us. Um, I think I may have jacked it up a little bit. But... Oh, no, that's okay. It happens a lot. I'm Kian Amadi. Great to have you. Begin. Can I with my testimony? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you to the rest of the committee for hearing me. My name is Kiana Mahdi. I'm a high school student, a sophomore actually, and I'm Amnesty International's student activist coordinator for the state of Connecticut. I believe we urgently need to create an office for gun violence prevention in the state. It's crucial that we establish a grant making authority like that to consistently fund community centric programs so that we can reduce street level gun violence. Lack of action hurts members of our community, we are human beings. A system must do justice to everyone within it or it does not work for anyone at all. Funding programs like Project Long, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> Funding programs like Project Longevity that have proven to reduce rates of gun homicides is how we make that kind of progress. Law enforcement must work with community leaders so that people feel genuinely, genuinely protect, protected by their law enforcement and not unsafe and fearful for their lives and interactions with them. I also wanted to echo what Ms. Dorsey and so many other people have said today about a greater need and emphasis on youth activities and recreational centers and other outlets for youth to end up and even before they get to juvenile so that we have investment in these kinds of programs so that there's places for them to go and outlets for them to have. Um, and, and also in terms of mental health, which I think is often not talked about in the discussion of gun violence prevention is the fact that it's a mental health crisis. crisis. And so I wanted to uh, emphasize the need for investment in those kinds of programs, especially for youth and especially because gun violence in communities causes a lot of trauma. And I wish we were more concerned with those kinds of solutions as opposed to punitive measures, especially for first offenders and young adults. I'm not here as an activist today though. I'm here for the generations that will come after me and my children because my generation is not exempt from this epidemic. Um, I'm here today because I remember Sandy Hook and I had friends there and I still think of that day that my mother rushed to pick me up from school. She was on the verge of tears and she had come to give me a hug because she needed to reassure herself that I was still safe at school. These aren't memories I want my children to have just when they get picked up from after school activities. I don't want my children to be out at school, out, out, out on the street protesting 
because there was a shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas or another high school near them. I don't want them to have to practice an evacuation plan when they go to synagogue to pray. I don't want them to have to be scared to go to school like I was after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Even in the places that I was meant to feel most comfortable and protected, for somehow the system ended up letting down a lot of the youth because we end up feeling unsafe and unprotected in the places that we are told that we go to to be feel safe. As a refugee, I always heard stories of my father from my father's life as a 15 year old in the streets of Tehran protesting and getting shot at for his protests. Coming to New Haven. So, Kian, I'm gonna um, ask you to just wrap it up for us a little bit. In, in one sentence, if I may summarize, I, I wanted to say that <clears throat> His stories of getting shot at in the streets of Tehran is not what I want to feel when I go downtown to New Haven. I want to feel like our lawmakers are funding strategies like they did, like they've done in Massachusetts with the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative and in Maryland that really work because it's only fair to the people that we establish, you know, continue consistently funded system strategies that we can effectively prevent gun violence. And that's why I support the establishment of an office for gun violence prevention in the state. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, your leadership and your advocacy. Uh, questions from any of our members? Okay. All right, thank you, Kian. Okay, Dr. Kevin Burr. Thank you, Senator Moore, Chairman Woods, and esteemed members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to share my thoughts on the establishment of a commission on gun violence intervention and prevention. Uh, my name is Kevin Bork. I'm the executive director of the Injury Prevention Center at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. I, I did submit written testimony, but uh, to my, tonight my comments will diverge from it a, a, a little bit. Um, there are so many ongoing conversations on how to improve health outcomes for children, families, and individuals, including those impacted by violence. In fact, recently, Speaker Ritter held a hearing on, on uh, behavioral health, where they pointed out uh, different interventions that uh, cross over with uh, violence prevention and intervention uh, strategies. Uh, I, I, we, we can achieve what we want, which is an end to violence by taking a cross-sector approach. And I've heard so much uh, tonight and uh, in, in the previous testimony and uh, in, in, in the previous hearing about uh, this great cross-sector uh, collaboration that is possible. Uh, Reverend Bennett in his testimony talked about the need uh, for resourcing after school programs. Michelle Voigt, talked about the need for victims to be more strongly supported uh, with one-to-one -one services. Letitia Nelson talked about the importance of re-entry services. Sean Reeves of early childhood programs. Gregory Jackson uh, looked at uh, targeting um, services across sector, uh, sectors, housing, education, childcare, behavioral health services. Deborah Davis uh, spoke of the need for collaboration across state agencies. And Dr. Fisher, in one of his many points, presented evidence, of course, about the impact of improving the physical environment and what that does for violence. Aswad Thomas spoke of the need for wraparound services, and Ed Calderon called for a comprehensive approach. And of course, tonight we heard many talk about comprehensive, taking a comprehensive approach. Dr. Shapiro, uh, Dr. Jandro, my colleagues at Trinity Health and Hartford Hospital uh, spoke of this comprehensive approach. And, uh, you know, I am. Uh, I am humbled by the collective experience that has been brought to this meeting tonight and the wisdom of all the speakers. And I agree with all of the points made around uh, violence intervention services, needing to strengthen them. And we, um, we can achieve ending violence uh, if we adopt a, a stance that uh, adopts over communication and really intense collaboration. And we need to move towards that health and human services approach to solve the problem. It's typified by early interventions and supports and, and an outcome which you know, goes beyond ending violence, beyond ending gun violence, and an outcome that is the social, emotional health and well-being of children and families and individuals. Um, 
we need to focus on all our programs and look at how are we strengthening protective factors of families and individuals, uh, looking at how do we evaluate the programs. And as many have, have talked about, implementing those programs that we know from the evidence base that they actually work. Now, this is this is a lot to do. And uh, Kevin, that's why, on, sure, I'll wrap up. up. On time. Yep. Th right, this thanks. is a lot to do. Uh, and, you know, we can't do that without a commission like the one that's proposed. So we really do need this commission on gun violence intervention and prevention to take that comprehensive approach that's needed. Thank you. And thank you as well, Kevin. Uh, questions from many of our members. Okay, hearing none. Thank you very much, Kev. Okay, um, Elijah Ratner. Elijah? Yes. Okay, you're up. Thank you. <laughs> First, I'd like to begin by giving a big thank you to the board for listening to me today. My name is Elijah Ratner, and I'm a resident of Woodbridge, Connecticut, and I'm a sophomore in high school and an Amnesty International member. In Connecticut, there is a pressing need for the creation of an Office for Community Gun Violence. Although there has been a substantial decrease in gun homicide deaths since the 1990s, it is currently on the rise. From 2019 to 2020, there was a 53% increase in gun homicide deaths. Many of these deaths are in Connecticut's largest and most populous cities. At present, we lack a consistently funded strategic system that would make the towns we spend so much time and safer. To tell you a little about myself, I'm going to tell you about my childhood. I grew up in a Jewish household and attended the Jewish elementary school. I remember on my first week of school in kindergarten, an announcement from the office which stated, there is a visitor in the building. Now, I know that that was our code for lockdown. At the time, though, I didn't know this. Immediately, my teacher locked the doors and my class hid under, hid under our desks. When I asked what was going on, my teacher told me that there was a lockdown drill at school. Now I know that there was, that we had this lockdown drill to prevent a, a school shooting to, in case there was a school shooting. There should not be a need for this drill though. Nobody should have access to guns necessary to shoot up a school. Further, no kids should have to fear being shot at their school, a place where we go to learn and be safe. Even at my synagogue services, we have to have a security guard at the front door who checks our bags to make sure nobody's bringing a firearm into services. We also routinely practice evacuating the building. I hate that now I have to prepare for the worst in the places where I should be making my most positive memories. I'm saddened by it and also fearful. People should not have to spend time preparing escape plans for the moment that gun violence occurs. Instead, lawmakers should be acting preemptively and funding effective long-term programs to reduce gun violence. I believe I have a right to feel safe in my place of worship and school, and I want future generations to be able to attend services without questioning their safety. And with that, thank you very much. And thank you, Eli, as well, for your young leadership and, um, and your testimony. Any questions from our members? Okay, hearing none, we are now to Miss Shirley Ellis West. Good evening. First, I want to um, thank the advisory committee for the opportunity to participate in this most important um, conversation um, and, uh, conversation this afternoon, I mean, this evening. Um, but I'm not going to spend my time, um, you know, repeating some of the um, information around the, um, you know, you know, what's going on in our communities, because I think that's been said. Um, you know, and I have appreciated, you know, the comments I've heard in this process. So, you know, um, we know what the problem is. So I'm going to not focus on the problem, but I will, um, I will start to, um, you know, really think about some of the strategies that, that we have implemented over the years and some of the things that we might continue to consider. And, you know, so I'm Shirley Ellis West. I'm the executive director for Urban Community Alliance. Um, my, I have a 30 year history um, in, in the New Haven community, supporting children, youth and families, um, professionally, politically, civically. And so I feel that, you know, when it comes to gun violence and, 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 uh, and, and, and supporting children, youth and families in the city of New Haven, you know, I have a long history of advocating on their behalf. And so currently at, at Urban Community Alliance, which is formerly the New Haven Family Alliance, um, the result of, a mer of merging two, two nonprofit organizations about two years ago, which was the New Haven Family Alliance and the VETS Mentoring Program, we are now, um, we are now the Urban Community Alliance in New Haven. But my, my history and my experience involves um, you know, some strategies that we've, I've heard in this, this um, meeting tonight. 
um, that support street outreach worker program, um, prevention programs such as juvenile review, I mean, juvenile review boards and restorative models, um, mentoring. And, you know, and I feel blessed to be one of the leaders in my community that have not only um, participated um, in these strategies, but been intimately involved in the implementation of, of, of each of these strategies. And so the first thing I like to um, urge is that, you know, um, whatever happens in this process and our, and our support of reducing gun violence, particularly youth gun violence in our community, that we, we look to sustain those programs that um, the, the programs that I highlighted a minute ago, that there are, that, that we have results that we, that show results that really work. So we have results in these programs. Um, but so I'm going to end, I'm going to end by sharing just, just something that, you know, I feel really, um, you know, strongly about that happened over the summer. So um, pre and pre and pre COVID, we knew that there were, there was a percentage of young people in our communities, particularly in urban communities that were struggling after COVID, you know, those young people um, presented younger and, and, and what we see today is a result of, of COVID, trauma, mental health. I mean, just a, a variety of things. And so, and so you know, one of the things that, you know, um, I, I, I feel really challenged with in my community is that, you know, even though, you know, I have programs that are funded um, and, and, and specific for, um, you know, specific to support prevention and intervention, such as, you know, mentoring and JRBs, you know, there are young people in the community that do not come to us through a referral. They're just there. So um, back in August, uh, myself, Ms. yes. Uh, Ms. West, you, you've actually come the time. Okay, um, okay. Just no. give you a moment to wrap it up, yep. Okay, so all I wanna say is that um, someone alluded to the fact that you know, we cannot do this alone. And so, um, and, and, and the young people that we, the young people that, that we should be most concerned about right now, and, you know, in, in this, in this, um, in where we are, these are young people that may not come through our door through a referral. So we must, you know, as a, as a, as an, or as a community come together collaboratively, because we have to be able to support these young people and doing it together is one of the most powerful and valuable things that we can do. And I thank you for the opportunity to add some insight into this conversation, um, because it, it really is important and the time is now and we can't wait any longer. So thank you. And thank you, Ms. West as well. Uh, any questions from our members? Ms. West, I have one. Yes. I know your history. I've worked with you. You and I have traveled across yeah. the country. How you doing, Andrew? It's good I'm to see you. It's, it's good to see you as well. <laughs> Uh, Shirley, you know, we talk a lot about evidence-based programs, mm -hmm. but you alluded to, in some respects, non, what's considered non-evidence-based programs, mm -hmm. community-centric programs. Mm -hmm. What do you think we ought to be considering? Do you think we ought to be considering not just evidence-based programs, but also those community-centric programs that are inside neighborhoods such as yours? Uh, most certainly, I think that we should be considering those programs that are not non-evidence based, and I'll and I'll and I'll use the street outreach worker program as 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 the example. Um, and and so don't don't quote me, but somewhere between 2009 2010, the street outreach worker program was implemented and created by the New Haven Family Alliance. Um, and it was not it was not evidence based. It was it was a program that was funded by the city to basically really look at and 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 start to start to um think about strategies for reducing youth gun violence because at that time we had lost two 13 year olds to to, to gun violence in the community. Um, so that strategy within three years, we saw that strategy show some results of reducing youth gun violence in the community. You know, it wasn't evident, evidence based, but we saw the results. Um, our partners were law enforcement, um, school, you know, New Haven Public Schools, New Haven Police Department, you know, community, but together we saw results in that. And so that's an example of not. Um, thinking of an evidence-based program, but something that was not evidence-based that we saw work. And I can, I, and I think I can look at, I can say the same thing about some of the restorative justice models. Um, New Haven, Hartford, and Bridgeport 
were one of the first were, were the first three urban urban communities to implement ju juvenile review boards or restorative models. Not evidence based, but we see results and keep in diverting these young people from these first time juven these first and second time juvenile offenders from the criminal justice system. We see the evidence in that. Today we saw it, you know, we saw it years ago and we still and we see it again today. And and you know, so we're so I feel my, my heart is really, you know, heavy because you know, being a part of reducing youth gun violence in that way and seeing it emerge itself again, you know, over the past, you know, year and a half, that that that's that's really hurtful. And I know that we have something we can do. And so that's not evidence based, but we know what to do. We have something we can reach back to, and we have some and, and there, we have something to work from. And so so I, I certainly um, don't think all the programs need to be evidence-based. Thank you very, very much, Sister. Now, I see Jeremy Stein has his hand up as well. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Shirley, I just want to follow, thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you do. Um, and um, um, I wanted to just follow up on, on Andrew's question. Um, I, I heard Barbara Fair mention this earlier and, and also um, Greg Jackson had mentioned this in his testimony a couple of days ago or last week. Um, and you know what I what I've heard, and I, and I and I heard it from you as well. What I heard was the need to fund those programs that are working or that are proven to work, um, but you know they may not fit the a, a particular model or mold. Um, Greg Jackson used the word evidence informed, right? Is that which is that kind of a, a better? way to be phrasing this is that we to, 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 to so that we support those kinds of programs that are still working in our community but maybe we need to be looking at different type of evidence or different type of gauges in which to look at their effectiveness of the program so like as evidence informed as opposed to evidence based so you know um, what we call it is what we call it but I, I do agree that a different strategy for looking at how we how we how we collect data and how we how we really show the impact and the influence of programs that are not necessarily evidence-based but we see results right I'm not you know it's not I'm wait that's out of my out of my my lane the you know the, the um the um the, the 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 strategy piece I mean not strategy piece but the um, scientific piece of this, you know, I'll leave that to the experts, but I'm sure that if we put our heads together, we can come up with um, um, a, a, a way to collect data on these programs that will support these programs, and, you know, at the same level that we hold evidence-based programs at, right? And, you know, I, I appreciate an evidence-based program, but, um, but for what many of us do in the community, as community-based organizations, well, that's not what they are, but we know, but we see results. We know we're impacting lives. We know we're, we're influencing. We know we're encouraging. We know we're empowering. We know that these young people will come to us. And we know that these young people, once they come, they trust where they are. And we know that we can make a difference in some of their lives. You know, if, if I had a, a, a little bit of time, you know, in my, in my testimony, I would talk about something that we did with, with, with seven young men about three months ago. And, and where we see one, it's just one, I mean, out of, out of the seven that showed up, one is continuing, but that one that's continuing is making progress like nobody business. And we did that not because it was a program, it was just myself and, an, and a, myself, a pastor, and a community, a, a youth advocate, we got together and we identified seven young young men in the community just because we wanted to do something to help. And so that's not evidence-based, but we're making the difference in at least one of those young people's lives, if not more than one, if that makes sense um, to in response to your question. Yes, it, yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Shirley. Um, Tina? Thank you, Andrew. Um, Shirley, I just want to echo everything that you're saying. And I just want to uh, you know, challenge those of us that are researchers in the room that it's not always about the way we're used to doing research and we need to find those data 
points that uh, you know, can show that your programs work. And surely I know your programs work because I've worked with you and, 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 and uh, you know, I don't think we always use the right metrics. So we need to figure that out for you. And we need to uh, show uh, the touch points, you know, um, that aren't always there. You know, how do you measure that, you know, what street outreach workers are doing that um, don't bring kids to the hospital, that don't get kids shot? You know, how do you capture that? And so, uh, you know, we need to collectively come up with some metrics that that help you, and, and that shouldn't be put on an organization. That should be those of us that uh, can do that to help you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks again, uh, Shirley, for your uh, testimony and your longstanding fight in this effort. Uh, next up is Dean Jones. How are you doing? All right, good, good. Hey, Dean. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, what's the, the question that's posed? Oh. What's the words? I'm sorry, what's that again? Can you repeat the question that, that that's posed to the group? Yeah, actually it was, um, it was a question I had, but I wanted to know um, if you had a if you had a, a, a statement or anything that the committee should know from your perspective, um, it was more of to hear directly from you. And I can certainly ask you the same question that I had for others, but um, did you okay. have a tes uh, testimony that you had prepared or? Uh, yeah, so I'm coming on tonight, um, a representation of Compass Youth Collaborative for this particular testimony, talk about the work that, that's being done with about 160 young people in the city of Hartford that are high risk, uh, that have an opportunity because they're connected to an agency that um, is involved for their best interest. Uh, we're servicing young people in the um, whole Hartford, not one side. Making sure that they have the tools, basic needs, and skills to have an opportunity to be successful. You guys have any questions for me that you want me to answer? Um, I think that might be sufficient enough in terms of your um, your, your testimony, Dean. But I, I do have one question that I actually put to Shirley. Um, Tell us, Wes, is that we do talk a lot about evidence-based programs, but there are other programs and activities in our community that keep kids off the street, keep them safe, oh. that are not necessarily considered evidence-based and has been earlier or just a, a speaker ago mentioned, the evidence informed. Uh, but the bottom line is that there are folks who are doing some great work in our communities that uh, programs are not considered evidence-based. What's your thoughts on that and how effective do you think some of these strategies in the community are at keeping oh, kids off the street? I'm, I'm glad you said that because a lot of our base, evidence-based uh, programs are based off of psychology. And just last week, uh, you guys can look it up. The Association of Psychology made a public apology for kind of steerheading some of the racial tension and, and misdiagnosis that has happened in our community. So a lot of our evidence-based programs um, are based off of what a psychologist may have said who've done research in Minnesota, but not necessarily pertaining to an urban youth who is here like in Hartford, Brooklyn, uh, or, or anywhere that's an urban setting. So I, I, I also do a basketball program called Hoop Wave that is, 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 is not evidence-based on paper, but it's evidence-based in, in, in practice because I, I touch a lot of young people through that, through the means of that. Um, and I know that what we do is significant in um, supporting young people. Uh, so the work I do in general is hand-to-hand -hand work. If with, when I'm with Compass, directing the street outreach program, that's doing a mentor and the case management model that's supporting 160 plus young people uh, that was responding to crisis response, which is, is evidence-based. 
or if I'm doing my basketball mentor piece that's dealing with young people who may have the same traumas, but the, the basketball court is giving them a different outlet. And they're able to mentor younger peers and do work in the community or community service projects as well. So that, that's that's my, my take on evidence-based. I don't wanna to get too deep into it, but you no, can you look at what I was talking about with psychology too. You can look up, uh, cause I know a lot of your grants got a lot of big psychologists in them. <laughs> and now you're gonna see that they made a public apology on a reference to racism. We appreciate it, Dane, and, there's, um, and all the good work that you've been doing for quite some time now. Any questions from our members? Okay. All right. Thanks, Dane. Okay. Next up, uh, Christopher Bridgeland. Uh Good evening. Um, thank you. I just want to thank Dean for being here. Um, thank you, Chairman, uh, Senator Moore, and the committee members for hosting this public, hear public hearing and allowing us to um, show our support for the creation of an Office of, gun of Community Gun Violence Prevention. My name is Christopher Brecklin. I'm the Director of Data and Digital Systems at Compass. I'm speaking on behalf of Julia Corrigan, who was originally scheduled to talk tonight. Um, Compass works with Hartford's highest risk youth. So to reiterate some of the things that Dean was saying, we build transformative relationships uh, to provide our youth with the supports and opportunities they need to overcome obstacles and succeed in education, employment, and life. Our model is just one of the many examples of the community-based intervention strategies being implemented across Connecticut. We call our frontline staff peace builders. That's peace builders are their case managers, their mentors, their teachers. Uh, they help youth build peace in their minds, in their lives, um, in their community. In fact, many of our peace builders were high-risk youth themselves, and they know firsthand the obstacles that our youth are facing every single day. Their ability to relate to the young people is what makes their relationship so transformational. In just the last five years, Compass has worked with hundreds of young people in Hartford and had over 100,000 intentional interactions with the goal of building those meaningful relationships. The peace builders are trained, um, again, in how, what Dean was talking about is cognitive behavioral theory as a way to teach them life-saving skills. And CBT is a way to understand how situations in our lives affect how we think and feel and respond to trauma. Uh, the peace builders are trained to use CBT in the moment to help young people identify a negative emotional cycle to stop and then to use a learned skill to make a positive choice instead of reacting impulsively. That intervention strategy can and has saved so many lives in Hartford alone. At Compass, we know that that change is also not going to happen overnight, that it's not a straight line and it doesn't happen easily. It takes deep and meaningful relationships to change the trajectory of a young person's life. And our peace builders, they will keep showing up and they will keep reaching out because those peace builders know that a trusting relationship is critical in transforming a young person's life. And we also know that that youth in crisis is not gonna come looking for us. So instead we go out and we find them. The peace builders, they're out in the community on the streets and they're seeking out traumatized youth that are trapped in that cycle of, of violence and poverty, and violence and poverty. We also uh, are building partnerships with the community, education, judicial systems, to just identify these youth. And once they're enrolled, most peace builders are out there connecting with them multiple times per week, helping them with basic needs, the life skills coaching, career and educational assistance and counseling to get them back on track. You know, we, we think that our model is just part of an ecosystem of community organizations that need a lot more resources to continue that work and facilitate that systemic change. And that would really benefit from the creation of an Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention. So thank you very much for a chance to talk about this tonight. And thank you for your testimony as well. Uh, any questions from our members? Okay, thank you, Christopher. Okay, next up, Maria Van Gelder. Maria? Maria Van Gelder. Going once, going twice. She's on the. She's on her phone, Andrew. She is okay. Can everybody hear me? 
Yes, we yes. can. We can see you as well. Great. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you for having me on tonight, uh, my esteemed colleagues, as well as the uh, local and state legislators. Uh, my name is Maria Van Gelder, and I am the nurse practitioner at Yale New Haven Hospital for Trauma. Um, I'm not here really to represent uh, what I do in the hospital. I think it was very well said by uh, my physician colleagues from Hartford and St. Francis. I'm also glad that they presented their statistics as mine might not have been so accurate. <laughs> however, um, I just wanna share with you, however, in my role, uh, that there is not one, I would say not three days that goes by uh, where there are not at least one victim of violence in this community and sometimes several. Uh, gunshots are not isolated. Uh, I wanted to also point out to the brown and black communities for males, uh, we get many, many females that are also uh, victims of violence who are shot, uh, stabbed and assaulted in many other ways. Um, the uh, violence uh, uh, epidemic and public health crisis is, is uh, uh, completely on the verge of being out of control. And clearly I'm here to support any type of legislation which will increase funding and awareness for violence prevention efforts uh, in the um, state community local levels. Um, for many years, I have uh, worked alongside with um, obviously uh, Dr. Violano um, and uh, Dr. Doddington. Um, we have also, uh, I have participated in Do uh, Project Longevity led by the incomparable Stacey Spell for maybe seven years now. This is an organization that takes uh, young men uh, who are already in trouble on parole, working with local, state, and federal law enforcement, uh, making them aware that they are, in fact, being watched and that they should cease and desist from their current or planned uh, criminal activities. They are very frank and clear with these young males that are gathered in this uh, particular with Project Longevity telling them that they are being watched and that they should stop the actions that they're participating in that pertain to violence because they will end up either shot, killed, or incarcerated. It is a real talk program. It is highly effective. Um, many of the people here in, in, that I have heard testify tonight have either been a part of it or uh, been present at some of the Project Longevity uh, interventions. Um, and the results are very real and have made a difference. They offer these men um, counseling, mental health, um, community resources and employment opportunities as well as educational opportunities. The other group I wanna quickly mention, which is invaluable to me uh, where I work is the HVIP hospital violence intervention, which leads also to the Connecticut violence intervention programs. This of course, without would be remiss without mentioning the street uh, outreach workers. Uh, these are persons who show up at the hospital morning, noon, and night to support the victims and their families um, in the multiple, multiple levels uh, that people in the community and families that are affected when one person is shot. Um, the ripple effect equals ripples of grief as well as uh, street outreach and violence intervention workers intercept uh, waves of retaliation and they serve to decompress persons in and around the hospital at the time of the incident. These efforts are invaluable to me and us as a health as, as healthcare providers. Uh, I can remember one particular person who was assaulted female. Uh, not only was she shot, but she was assaulted with a hammer I wanna mention Antoine, the social worker from uh, the HVIP who showed up and CTVIP who showed up, assisted the woman, assisted me discharging the woman from the hospital and uh, arranged for police to be at her house to watch and protect her, arranged for counseling in the community for this person and her children, arranged for other family members to come and stay with her in her house and having a uh, safe and secure discharge continuing on our care continuum, they assist us with those efforts, transitioning these persons back into the community safely with support once they are discharged from the hospital and not just 
returning them to the community unsupported. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for your testimony. And um, any questions from the members? Jeremy. Uh, MJ, thank you so much for your testimony and for, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen you without your scrubs on. Um, I, 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 and I just wanted to, <laughs> to point out um, testimony that I've heard that you testify about in Project Longevity. It was probably one of the most horrific things I've ever heard in my life, but absolutely the truth, which is your description of what a bullet does to the human body. Um, and, um, but I, but I wanted to go back question, uh, question that I have about you, a statement that you made about that. This is a panda, this is an epidemic that's out of control. Yes. So, um, you know, the state, when it came to COVID, you know, the state stepped in and has done, you know, drastic efforts and put in a lot of resources to try to, um, give resources to reduce that or cure that epidemic. Um, and you and you seem to relate gun violence in the same way. Do you think that the state has an obligation to be doing the same thing at the state level? And you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, I, yes, absolutely. And this is part of the reason why I felt so strongly to share uh, whatever I could to help, like I said, uh, facilitate support um, at the state level. We are behind. We are grossly behind. Uh, the groups that are out there now, the people that are participating in this committee, these are the people that are making a real and effective change. These are the people who have boots on the ground. Many of us are volunteers like myself who have been part of these efforts for over five or seven years. And I know that all of us give our time uh, unfunded right now um, it, in many, many, many ways, as you've heard tonight by, by the unbelievable people with their efforts. But I feel as though we are we are markedly behind other places, other other states. And um, I think that developing a um, really receiving funding and developing an office, as they were mentioning earlier, with um, adequate uh, staffing to disperse these funds in a um, in a realistic way, not only to the groups that are sort of well organized, who are familiar with writing grants or whatever, but to the other grassroots organizations that they were saying, the non evidence based uh, groups who deserve funding for their good efforts and they've been around for a long time. And as as Dr. Villano was speaking of is they will eventually capture these statistics once we do develop those points where we will be able to uh, capture the statistics on the efficacy of those grassroots organizations. But we are behind. We need this funding desperately. Okay. All right. Thank you again, um, Ms. Gelder. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Pepe Vega. Hello. I'm Pepe Vega. And I've um, been a leader of violence intervention for over 10 years. I'm a lifelong resident of New Haven. And this testimony is my own. I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization or my employers or anybody. In 2018, after years of working informally with the group now represented by the Connecticut Violence Intervention Program, a hospital-based hospital violence intervention program at Yale New Haven Hospital was created, providing a crisis response team for victims in our emergency department, which I now lead, and follow up wraparound case management services. In 2019, we were able to hire a victim services coordinator, Mr. Antoine Ned, who is a social worker and my direct partner. Myself, our leaders of victim services outreach. As a victim of community violence myself, I represent in every way the credible messenger who we need to do this work. I was the first person hired into such a role at the hospital in the state of Connecticut. And now I also hold the violence prevention professional certification, thanks to Mr. Andrew Woods. I work in direct collaboration with the CTVIP. I'm extremely excited for the opportunity to be a part of such a game-changing initiative. I wish my best, my, my three best childhood friends who were all killed from gun violence could be here to witness this effort. And they would have benefited so much from a program like this. I have witnessed the success of our program. A young adult client who was enrolled in a program after being shot was homeless and kicked out of high school. I am proud to say that because of the wraparound services of the program, 
He is living in a safe, stable environment now, working at Amazon, and I am currently in the process of getting him enrolled in adult education so he can obtain his high school diploma. This all being said, our violence intervention program, including our community partners at CTVIP, are underpowered and underfunded to support the needs of countless victims. Violence intervention programs depend on the ability of both hospital and community organizations to train and sustain credible messengers like myself, who can effectively reach victims and coordinate case management services. I strongly urge your support, the creation of Commission on Violence Prevention, as it will provide the momentum needed to grow violence intervention programs across our state and provide services to our victims. Thank you. Pepe, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from our members? Pepe, I wanna thank you like many other frontline workers, um, credible messengers, violence prevention professionals, we use those names interchangeably, but they all do one thing, one thing good. And that is what you just got through outlining like several other members and the importance of making sure that there are folks like yourself and others that are out here on our streets interacting with those that need us at great risk. And so I, I salute you, my brother, as I do others that have been on this panel or who have testified tonight. And I look forward to working with you uh, continuously. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you very much. You got it. Um, our next speaker is uh, Sherelle Banks. Hands up, um, Dr. Doddington. Has a question. Oh, hands up. Uh, dot I didn't see it. Sorry about that, Doddington. My apologies. I just wanted to thank Mr. Pepe Vega for his incredible uh, statement, as well as uh, MJ in representing uh, our program and the work being done at the hospital. Just, just a note of thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Sherelle, Sherelle Banks. Hi, greetings. Thank you to the advisory committee and everyone on the call. Snaps up to the courageous youth leadership that was also on the call. Um, thank you for sharing your testimonies and using your voice in the city and in your community around the ways to address and treat mental health and to reduce gun violence. My name is Sherelle Banks, coordinator, youth nonviolence trainer for Connecticut Center for Nonviolence. Um, racism is a public health crisis. And I like to ask, or you could think about, you don't even have to respond, uh, how are the children? That was clearly stated and voiced with our youth leaders that came on earlier. Thank you once again. Um, the Connecticut Center for Nonviolence is a leader in nonviolence education. Um, they are dedicated to bringing people from diverse, diverse communities together in dialogue and creating expression to explore the root causes of violence and to learn constructive methods of developing and applying alternative solutions. Connecticut Center for Nonviolence work is relevant to reducing community violence or dealing with its impacts by working with youth who we call thinking youth nonviolence by implementing um, nonviolence labs within high schools, such as Civic Leadership High School. Um, we're looking to place nonviolence labs in many other schools. Um, in these labs, we help youth to, in classifying four different types of levels and conflicts. Um, they do role playing to learn conflict reconciliation, peer to peer training and how, to re, how reacting out of emotions doesn't work and how responding with education, empowerment, and saving life does. Um, the principle that we, we teach six principles of nonviolence and the one that sticks out and I use the most is principle number three, attack forces of evil, not the persons doing evil. So we find out ways to address and identify those systems and how to effectively um, push back. Connecticut Center for Nonviolence addresses violence in a broad perspective. When you hear the word violence, what do you think of? King definition of violence is emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual harm. We need wraparound services and projects from agencies and organizations who deal with the multiplicity of violence and how it impacts individual families and communities. The key challenge that keeps organizations from having a greater impact is access to more youth by placing more nonviolence lives throughout the schools and funding to increase awareness and opportunities to unite with other youth around the state working on the same issues towards the framework of the future, which is the beloved community. There's an urgent need for the state to do more. The city is at its 
30 plus homicide. Racial justice cannot be achieved if residents of black and brown communities are not safe where they live. That trauma ripples into the lives of our youth in the community and in the schools. How can they learn? When black and Latinx youth are routinely, ex routinely exposed to gun violence, this can change brain development, as we know, and has immediate harmful effects, especially related to learning. The state is not adequately funding gun violence prevention and intervention programs, which is needed. Thank you to all the grassroots organizations for the work that is being done in our community to address gun violence in our community. It does start at home. It does still take a village to raise a child. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. All hands are needed on deck. Remember, unity is in a community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Banks. Uh, any questions from our members? Ms. Banks, before you go, I just wanna thank you as well for um, not only do are you connected with the uh, King and Nonviolence Center, but also you do a lot of great work with Blue Hill Civic Association as well. But I've yes. happened to see the King and Nonviolence Center up front and center on this issue as you guys work in schools, out inside the communities and with multiple different partners, including law enforcement. And when we talk about non-evidence-based programs, if you will, uh, this one here ranks at that, um, in that category as well. But I yes. wanna just highlight that because I know personally the work of folks like yourself, Reverend James Lane, uh, your leader, uh, Ms. Chris Dowell, as well as Warren Hardy and others that are, that are part of the Kingy and non-violence approach. And again, the work that you and others are doing over at Blue Hill Civic, like Brother Lovejoy um, mm -hmm. and Paris Smith, keep up the great work. We love you and, um, and have a good night. Thank you. You too. Okay, uh, Miss, uh, I'm sorry, Jakai uh, Padilla, if I pronounced that correctly. Padilla, Jakai Padilla. Going once, going twice. Okay, yes, Yesi Ray, Reyes. Yesi Reyes. Going once, going twice. Okay, Yvette Jackson. Yvette Jackson. Going once, going twice. Celeste Fulcher. Celeste Fulcher. Hi, good evening, Hi. everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be able to share my piece. Um, my name is Celeste Fulcher. I lost my daughter 2013 to a nightclub shooting here in New Haven. Uh, she was 26 at the time. Um, I have a nonprofit organization that I'm um, partnered with, with um, Mothers United Against Gun Violence. And my piece that's on the gun violence part, I'm thinking, well, I feel, not me thinking. I really believe funding would be very helpful, you know, very fundamental in the um, parts of the organizations to help with the use, because that's my biggest concern. The, I, I feel like people tend to forget about the youth when victims, um, when, when people get killed as far as siblings and things like that. So that's my biggest concern. And also the vocational schools. I feel like they need vocational schools. They need something for these kids to actually have, you know, kind of grasp onto some of the concerns on what they like to do with, the, with themselves and people could kind of jump on that and that can help forward their career as far as them being focused on something. Because right now with New Haven having nothing, I, I don't see because these kids are graduating with, with like a sixth grade level high school. So my piece is when they graduate, how do we expect them to further their careers or further their life when they were the sixth grade level? So I, I just have a lot of concerns about, you know, that and, you know, the whole gun, gun violence is, is absolutely awful. 
So, and, you know, the funding and things like that is definitely needed for the programs. There's a lot of programs that you guys um, mentioned tonight and there's so much great work, but how much could these people do, even myself, when, the, when there's not enough funding to have the, you know, to have people help because the more funding you would be able to engage more children, more youth. That's my thing. Thank, thank you very this much, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Fulcher. Hey, any questions for Ms. Fulcher? Jeremy. Hi, Celeste. Um, can you just speak a little bit um, about your work with the Botanical Garden of Healing that's in New Haven. I think it would be helpful for everybody to know that kind of work. And as we're talking about, you know, evidence-based or non-evidence-based, but certainly something that is incredibly important to the community that you and um, others help build, Marlene Pratt and others help build, which is, you know, really um, important thing for both survivors and, and, and reduction in gun violence. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Jeremy. I am one of the co-founders of the Botanical Garden. And during that process, um, we started back in 17 with the planning. And that was very fresh for me because I just lost my daughter in 13. So, um, you know, as we were doing the planning process with the garden, things like that, you know, our biggest piece was the awareness part. So when we agreed to do the, the bricks, um, it, it, you know, people been down there, they noticed it had the name and the age and the age is what we wanted basically to, for people to be aware and kind of catch an eye, an eye opener because it ages tend to be between the 16 and 24 age, age gap. Um, but it's, you know, it's incredible what we did. I'm, I'm happy, you know, I'm blessed to be a part of that. And we're just hoping more people get down there. We're hoping to not put more bricks, put it that way. You know, it's, it, it hurts my heart every time we have to put a brick in. Um, you know, every time I hear a, sh a, a shooting elsewhere, it's, you know, as, as a, a family and a mother that goes through that, it's painful. So, you know, with this money that's coming into Connecticut, families need help. Families need help, the, the, not even the, the community, because it affects everyone that's been associated with you, your child, your loved one, whoever, it affects everybody. It is not a very good feeling. Thank you. Thanks again, Ms. 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 Foucher. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Yes. I, I, I have a question. This is Deborah. Sure. Yeah, and we and we do. Uh, we are really familiar with uh, what Celeste does in um, the New Haven area. She's an unbelievable uh, frontline worker. Uh, but I did want to ask her because we actually uh, follow that peer to peer training evidence based model from Mothers United Against Violence, and that is mothers and mothers who are going through the same type of trauma and situations. What were your feelings on that, Celeste? on the feelings of the peer-to-peer? -peer. Yes. Um, no, it's absolutely awful. I'm absolutely awesome because, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer is when, you know, just to be able to reach out, you know, reach out to someone else and, you know, things like that, being hands-on is, is, is beautiful. Yes. And yeah. primarily because they've pretty much gone through the same thing. Right, exactly. And, and, it, and it, when you're able to go out to a family that's actually going through what you're going through, it's that it's somewhat of a relief. And just the fact of, you know, I'm, I'm a hugger. So, yeah. you know, just to be able to go out there and just put your arms around someone that's going through that, um, mm -hmm. that's going through that pain. And, you know, you don't even have to say words. You don't even, you don't even need words, but just to be able to face to face that person it's a big, it's a big deal. And even with my nonprofit organization, I'm going to be um, doing comfort baskets to all homicide victims. Mm -hmm. That's so, awesome. And I'm, That's and I'm excited about that. 
That's beautiful. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a great testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You. Thanks again, Walter. Okay. Next up, uh, Kent Ashworth. Advisory committee. I'm Kent Ashworth. I'm a volunteer research assistant for the past four years with Hartford Communities That Care, HCTC. And I'm here to summarize the written testimony prepared with Larry Johnson, who is HCTC's program director for frontline crisis response. I was doing frontline work in New Orleans before Larry was born. So we have a 40 year perspective together on unmet needs, under resourced prevention efforts, and uh, small agendas that take precedence over sustainable strategies, if you will. By way of background, HCTC and St. Francis Hospital founded the crisis response team in 2004. This team became Connecticut's first hospital link violence intervention program or HVIP. It's dealt with more than 1800 cases of violence and has measured the ROI return on investment. In the best case scenario, Larry's team works with victims and their families from the first hour of crisis over a six month period to achieve recovery and prevent retaliation and recidivism. If you ask anyone at any problem solving table, you get the same answer though, when it comes to preventing community violence, we are overmatched. The best case scenario in which victims receive care all the way to and through recovery is all too rare. Looking at how VPPs, violence prevention professionals, engage victims at the crime scene or the emergency department, and then build relationships throughout the stages of follow-up care, Larry and I attempted to look a little deeper than the distressing statistics, and we tried to focus on five major obstacles that diminish effective prevention. First, the culture of violence. The root causes of the culture of violence are chronic exposure to traumatic incidents and the funneling of guns into the streets. Second, access to care. Largely out of fear and mistrust, well over half of the gunshot survivors do not get recovery services and they're subject to re-injury, death, or becoming perpetrators of violence themselves. Third, unsafe environments. Survivors of gun violence return to drug-infested neighborhoods, unaffordable housing, and the numerous inequities related to poverty that we've been hearing about all night. Uh, by the way, there's an awesome amount of commitment on this call, and uh, I appreciate the chance to learn from it. Uh, Larry estimates that one in 10 gunshot survivors cannot access safe emergency shelter when they need it afterward, one in 10. Fourth point, uncertain support. With resources typically skimpy and indiscriminately allocated, support for prevention services is unpredictable. How can you plan ahead? Last but not least, attracting and keeping trained staff. Building the bench entails recruiting and retaining culturally aware, trauma-informed frontline workers and giving them the support they need to balance their personal lives amidst the stress of frontline work. Addressing the local conditions related to violence requires unique efforts in every neighborhood. Our thought was removing these five obstacles, which are detailed more fully in the written testimony, would be a useful starting point. And also, I've never stayed under three minutes in my life. <laughs> Ken, I'm very, very impressed. And I want to thank you for your testimony. I want to see if we got any questions from anyone, any of our members. Ken, I do have one question to elaborate on if you can, and that is the committee is tasked with developing a public health and community engagement strategy. What's your thoughts on what the legislature need to, what we need to consider um, adding to the report related to how we can go about developing that public health and community engagement strategy? Well, I think that in this work, as I've seen it, and I've studied it in everywhere from the, uh, the uh, Harlem Children's Zone to the Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, I worked as a journalist covering 
civil rights and, and other issues in education across the country, including school finance cases that go to the tax issues that were raised earlier. The point is, I guess, that there needs to be a multi-platform communications uh, engagement effort, and it needs to take into account the incredibly um, intricate data that are so important to understanding the issues, as well as the, to me, the um, sort of irreplaceable insights that you get from frontline workers, uh, from organizations like Mothers United Against Violence, and so many others in Connecticut, these organizations and these folks who've devoted their lives really um, to the lending of assistance to people in need, victims of violence, loved ones, uh, kids who are 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old are going to be the 24 to 30 year old uh, folk. And so I think that the, the point on communications and engagement is that it, it has to uh, go beyond war stories and go beyond the statistically correct um, with caveats sort of reporting and, and really cover the waterfront of the needs that we all know are there. It's, it's essentially, I think what I'm trying to say in uh, more than three minutes is that it's, it's not easy to write a report that is technically accurate and at the same time engages with all of these audiences. So I think it takes um, attention to all of those audiences and to what you really want to achieve with the report, with each audience. It's gonna be very different to reach uh, Senator Moore and her colleagues um, compared to the outreach that Larry does or that Pepe does at the emergency room or dealing with a security guard at the hospital, or uh, frankly, uh, dealing with the media, which tends to stereotype these incidents and to not uh, do a really comprehensive job of reporting on the real issues at play here, you know, which we all know. Um, I've been thinking about uh, for many years now, the fact that in 50 years, the Economic Policy Institute, uh, looking at improvements in terms of the social and economic circumstances of African-American families, finds disparities in unemployment, wages, income, household wealth, home ownership, infant mortality, life expectancy, of course, incarceration, and college graduation. Some of those rates are uh, off the hook in terms of terrible increases and others like home ownership in 50 years hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a systemic racism issue. It is an, an issue where systems have to be coordinated and understood and work together. And is that three minutes yet? Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. It, no, no. But, 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 but thank you for the, the additional thoughts. It, it definitely is helpful. And I believe that you know, we gain a lot from your insights. The main point I think is to ask yourself what you really want to achieve with the report. Thank you very much, Ken. Okay, all right, next up, uh, we have Tamika Leak. Tamika Leak. Going once, going twice. Okay. Millie Arsengenis. Millie Arsengenis. Going once, going twice. Okay, Noah. And your name is spelled D I. A R R A S S O U B A. Sorry for not. I don't want to chop up your name. 
from Amnesty Chapter at Hopkins School. Noah. Going once, going twice. Okay, Sophia, Sophia Delmonico. Also from Amnesty Chapter at Hopkins School. She's no longer able to provide testimony. Chairman okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Logan Phillips. Logan Phillips. Right here. Right here. Right. Logan. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah my, <laughs> my name is Logan Phillips, next. and uh, I'm speaking today to support the commission. You know, we made a lot of progress after Sandy Hook, uh, and one of the leaders in the nation reducing gun violence, and I think we can be proud of that. Uh, but it's also clear that communities look a lot more like me, um, did, are doing a lot better in terms of gun violence than black and brown communities, which, as of many things, uh, got far too left behind on this issue. And it shows that it's not just about good intentions, which uh, I know the, you know, the state legislature in Connecticut certainly has, um, but it's also about a good process. And that's why this commission is so important um, to ensure we do as much as possible from um, both our success and other states around the country that have moved forward on gun control in recent years uh, to have evidence-based solutions and to put equity front and center. So this time we're not leaving people behind um, and including local communities and activists front and center. The commission's gonna do all of this. Uh, and you know, we heard from a lot of families today, um, mothers that lost their kids, friends that lost their, uh, or pe people that lost their friends as well. And um, first of all, respect the heck out of everyone who was willing to come and speak. I think it's heroic to take that pain and, and channel them to action. Um, I hope I would be able to do the same thing. But second, it's kind of overwhelming, right? When you realize that's a very small slice of the larger problem. There's over 100 families in Connecticut, even in the best years that are dying from gun violence still in this state. And the pain leaves it in its wake. So we, we clearly need to do better. Um, our past success shows that we can do better. And I think this commission will put us in a good position to do so by using the resources that are coming in from the Biden administration uh, in the most efficient way possible. So thank you so much for uh, your time. And thank you for yours as well. Okay, any questions for Logan? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Logan. Uh, next up is Jonathan Perlow. Hello, thank you, Chairman Woods and Senator Moore and members of the advisory committee for hearing my testimony tonight. My name is Jonathan Perlow. I'm Director of Communications for Connecticut Against Gun Violence. While Connecticut has the sixth lowest rate of gun deaths in the nation, we still have an unacceptably high level of gun homicide, which disproportionately victimizes black and brown communities. Senate Bill 1 declared racism a public health crisis, so too is community gun violence. To achieve racial equity, preventing gun homicide must be part of the discussion. Equality can't be achieved if everyone isn't safe where they live, wherever they live. Sadly, this isn't the case in Connecticut. That's why CAGB launched the Connecticut Initiative to Prevent Community Gun Violence. Its objective is to establish an Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention, a state-level grant-making authority tasked with funding and implementing evidence-informed, community-centric programs to reduce street-level gun violence. Currently, 43 Connecticut and national organizations <clears throat> excuse me, are partners to the Connecticut Initiative. Among its primary responsibilities, the office would secure state and federal money to provide stable and predictable funding to violence prevention programs. It would establish grant criteria, award grants, guide implementation, offer technical expertise, and monitor programs to ensure objectives are met. The need and opportunity to create the office and Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention is now. There were 105 gun homicides in Connecticut during 2020, up 53% versus 2019. This year, homicides are up another 20%. With the potential for significant federal funding from Biden administration efforts, it's important the state has the capacity to secure its fair share. This shouldn't be an ad hoc endeavor. It requires dedicated staff to identify opportunities and secure grants. Given the urgency, we suggest the committee explore additional avenues to achieve the goals of the proposed commission that could have a faster implementation timeframe. One possibility is to provide the Department of Public Health's Office of Injury Prevention the resources it needs to fulfill the mandate it was given when established by the, stat, by the legislature 
nearly 30 years ago. Its duties include developing sources of funding to establish programs to prevent interpersonal violence, including homicide. The defined scope of injury prevention includes gun violence, even though the term gun is not in the statutory language. The case for acting now is strong. Around the nation, program models have proven track records of reducing interpersonal gun violence through prevention, intervention, and aftercare. While law enforcement has a critical role, in addition to project longevity and enforcement of our strong gun laws, Connecticut needs to invest in comprehensive solutions that go beyond policing. Through legislative and executive action, states across the country are investing in the organizational infrastructure similar to our proposed Office of Community Gun Violence Prevention to fund, implement, and support community-based violence prevention programs. These include California, Colorado, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, and also in many cities. There are life-saving solutions to be found in violence intervention and prevention programs, Connecticut needs to invest in the capacity to find, fund, and follow these programs as we have proposed in the Connecticut Initiative. Thank you for considering my testimony and for your work to make Connecticut's urban communities safe from gun violence. Happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony as well. Um, any questions for Jonathan? Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, committee. I appreciate it. All right, we have uh, Ebony McLeese. Hello, how are, how are you? Hello, Ebony. Okay, thank you so much for hearing my testimony. By the way, I am a new mother of twins, so if you hear somebody in the background, it's them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so my name is Ebony McLeese. I am the legislative coordinator for the state of Connecticut for Amnesty International USA. I'm a resident of New Haven, an educator, um, at Wilbercross High School in New Haven, Connecticut, and a member of the Connecticut um, Gun Violence Coalition. Um, so really, the U.S. is really failing in general with no working system of regulation, not enough funding for communities to a complex problem with disproportionate impacts on communities of color, as everyone talked about, that leads, that is a leading cause of death for black and brown boys and men with a decreased access to basic services. For me, there's the human rights argument. Um, and under the UDHR, our Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there's the right to live, security of person, and to be free from discrimination. And the US is failing, but not beyond hope. An implementa implementation of a system that restricts access to firearms and implementation of violence reduction or protection measures such as this office would be a way and a step in a good direction. We need to fund these violence intervention programs and have a centralized location in which all of that information and data can be set, whether it be through um, um, evidence-based practices or practices that consider evidence-based methods. Um, community violence prevention has been found to make inroads to reduce gun violence. It focuses on engaging community members with a lack of political will many, and, and many emphasis and it engages in an impact um, on the community by using community members as its focal point. The reality of the situation is in order for us to truly make the changes that we want to make, one thing that I urge this office to, do, to really focus on is economic inequality. Um, economic inequality seems to be at the forefront of a lot of at least inner city violence. Economic justice into violence prevention policy is a necessary step and legislators should be cognizant of the preventative potential of these such policies, such as those on the federal level and those in our state level. Gun violence is distinctively an American crisis and the costs of pursuing are incremental um, and reforms are just simply too limited scope at this point, um, which makes it very hard to get what we need. Um, I work in New Haven and I work with students as a person that is now a special education teacher, somebody that graduated from Wilbercross. I can remember countless times when I was 16, I attended five funerals of five friends. And now I see my own students dealing with the loss of their friends on a consistent basis, all because of gun violence. And so to have to have little black dresses or tuxes 
or pins with rest in peace as a common part of your wardrobe at 16 is something that's unheard of. And so I think this office being put together can focus not on the suburb, not just on the suburban viewpoint of gun violence, but also look at the greater um, urban impacts, understanding that in both areas, they are different. Um, so thank you for your consideration and hearing my testimony. And thank you, uh, Ms. McLeese as well. Any questions from our members? Okay, thank you again. Um, Alden Woodcock. He's unable to provide a testimony at this time, Chairman. Okay, great. Uh, Anthony Marshall. We have Anthony Marshall. Here he is. I just come off uh, mute, sir. So sorry. Um, peace and blessings. I have my daughter too with me, and uh, <laughs> she's giving me a, a time because it's getting late. So um, I'm Anthony Marshall. Um, I am the director and founder of my program called Pitch Peace in the Streets. Um, I also um, I, I'm someone who did time. I had 25 years um, coming home. I was able to participate and be a part of a program called Street Safe Bridgeport. Um, I worked with them for about seven years. Um, and um, being in that program, I was able to network and uh, meet a lot of people that um, allowed me to build my program and be able to access certain resources that is very important um, in, for, the, for the youth. Um, you guys talked about so many things, so many things. But um, I'm going to talk about two of the key things that I have uh, as a resource, as a resource with my program. And that is, I, I have a, you was talking about trauma and dealing with mental health. Um, I have actually a trauma group where I deal with, um, it's called Brothers Losing Brothers. And I work with uh, 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 counseling, Jewel of Joy Counseling Services, which are a therapist. So, I have secret meetings, secret meetings on each side of town with selective individuals that are involved in the streets, deep, deeply in the streets. Um, I have mothers that know these young men, these young men, and they actually get these young, gather these young men together and they sign them up to um, be able to come into this trauma group and talk about. Um, them losing their brothers, how they feel about it, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is very important. I do this secretly on every side of town um, in Bridgeport as we speak right now, as we speak right now. The groups are going to be starting up again um, in another three weeks, and they'll be able, you know, guys will be able to um, register um, in. And then another thing that I have um, that's very, very important is safe houses. Um, in order for a young man to really change their life, they have to leave this environment. Um, and that's what I was able to establish. I have a few safe houses out of state, which is three of them. I have three safe houses out of state. And I feel one needs to be built here in Connecticut. One needs to be here in Connecticut. And someone, uh, 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 an establishment like um, um, uh, um, they build the houses, um, Habitats of Humanity. They can be someone to voluntarily um, create a house upstate, upstate Connecticut, and have these young men and women be able to go up there and change their lives um, in a safe space where they'll be able to not have to worry about their surroundings. Because the situation in Bridgeport, I'm quite sure it's everywhere else. The situation in Bridgeport, it doesn't matter if you're from a certain side of town and you're not even involved with, with whatever's going on, there's still a possibility that you're going to end up losing your life. So um, not to take anything away from um, uh, Newtown and the Sandy Hook thing, because that was, that was something that was very, very uh, ho um, horrific and it should never have happened. But our kids deal with that on a daily basis. And there need to be some way that um, when they go to school, because they, they go to school every day and someone was killed probably last month. So it should be a, a, a situation where when these kids go to school and on that particular day, they deal with that trauma.
because in these groups that these young men, these are shooters. Some of them are shooters, some of them are not. They, they you know, they claim to be shooters. Um, they're in these groups and they're actually expressing themselves and then crying and crying after. They need a hug, so on and so forth, because they're able to let out what it is that they're going through. There's something that hey, I uh, learned. And hey, Anthony, I, I, Sorry. I, I got you at time, but you do have a few questions okay. um, that, that, I, that I know that you have. Um, Okay. You have a sum summary. Uh, can we? You gotta. You want to wrap so it up? So this is what I. This is a message that I do. I do always. Um. Uh, um. Uh, my model for my program is: if you love someone, don't put yourself in a situation to be taken away. So I put these youth in a situation to never be taken away um, from their families. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pina, have your hand up. Thank you, Anthony, for all that you do. It's a. It's important work question I have for you uh, when I was doing uh, hospital-based violence prevention work that you know the, some of the critical time is, is when the gunshot victims in the ER and the um, you know emotions are at probably at their their uh, worst and as we used to say is you know the emergency room is probably the most dangerous place in New Haven uh, when we have a gunshot victim there um, question I have for you is the the safe houses is what do you what do you recommend um, with folks that are in that critical piece that when they're in the ER like that that you know one of the things I struggled with is how to quickly do we move them and where do you move them to you know mm -hmm. we we would take money out of uh, you know our own pockets and stuff and put somebody up in a hotel but is that enough and is that safe um, and then are you know how long do you keep them in the safe house and when do you know when to transfer them do you take them out of state do you bring them to another state you know we, we've done a lot of talk about that but I'm not sure there's a right method to it uh, if, if there is even a method and is it individualized so 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 um, from my experience um, dealing with individuals um, going to a safe house a lot of times I get calls I get calls from the parents the mothers and say, listen, this is the situation with my son. Um, can you get him to a place ASAP? What I do in the beginning, what I do in the beginning is I will place them in a motel far upstate from, from Bridgeport, far from Bridgeport, until I contact the three safe houses to see who's open, uh, who's available. Now, if it's if the individual um his life is not like threatened like that but he just wants to go somewhere and change his life i also have an islamic center where i house individuals um that needs a place to stay or something like that or they're, they're you know they want to get out of their environment i house them there and try to find shelters outside of Bridgeport for them to go to and they'll be able to establish themselves up there uh, like in harford or somewhere further um further away from Bridgeport. um now, if it's someone urgent, if it's something urgent, then yes, I do have a resource where I, it's not a safe house, but it's a resource where I can send them up in New York and they'll be there until we find a safe house for them in DC, Philly, or the other place I have it. And do you do that just for New uh, for Bridgeport or anywhere? I do it for whoever. I do it for whoever. Mm -hmm. My my program actually is national. I I, I worked in Chicago, um, Richmond, Virginia, um, New Jersey, Philly, um, D.C., um, 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 I was Ohio, um, a few other places. So I'm I'm all over with the program, and that's how I was able to find these safe houses and things of that nature. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, hey, Anthony, good seeing you again. I came down years, several couple of years back, just in yes, training sir, yes, with um, mm -hmm. you know, Kenny, Kenny Jackson and folks down there yes, in the sir. center. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. I thank you all too for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much. You got it, man. All right. Take uh, care hi, hi, uh, Andrew. Yes. Uh, I had a, I have a question for Anthony. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anthony. This is Deborah Davis. Oh, I yes, just sir. wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing as well, because I yeah. know that's that's critically important as we go through this is the day-to-day -day real life situations mm -hmm. and we're not sitting behind a desk creating stats or any of that nature we're actually mm -hmm. on the ground looking at that how critical anthony though because i hear and i heard that you mentioned the mothers and the family at large um mm -hmm. how critical is that for the mothers to continue to connect and not just mothers that have been victims mm -hmm. um mothers that have actually impacted by 
a son that has committed the crime. So, so it's funny you um, brought that up. Um, a few years ago, um, I had myself and two other people, we had created a forum called Connecticut Mothers United for Healing. And um, Yana um, Dawn, she's um, one of the ones that came up with the, um, with the, um, the actual concept of dealing with empathy. And at that time, we brought the mothers that lost their children to gun violence and the mothers that actually their child was the one that committed the murder. Wow. We brought them together in Bridgeport at Houston time. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a day of empathy. We were able to um, um, build with the mothers, let them tell their stories. Um, they were able to be connected with Jula Joy um, counseling. And um, hopefully, you know, some of the mothers I know, they still deal with Jula Joy. Um, and they also in, in, in the programs with Yana um, and also um, in the programs with Tears of Triumph, um, mm -hmm. those, those programs here uh, up in, in Bridgeport. So yeah. a lot of the mothers that know what I do, they reach out to me automatically, even yes. if their son is in another program. Like, that's another thing. I, I want all programs are needed. All programs are needed. I was in Street Safe Bridgeport. They have a key, um, a key um, component that is definitely needed. And Pena, she spoke about upon it. And that's when you're going to the hospital, seeing, I, I have seen so many, I had to identify bodies so many times or, or sit there with the parent when they're identifying their body. So the parents remember that, you know what I'm saying? They will always remember that. Just today, I had text someone um, um, because this, this was a guy that they never knew who he was. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't even originally from Bridgeport. And I was able to identify him because I knew his tattoos and where he was from, I mean, where he was hanging at. And so I was able to identify, to the, I, I contacted the parent today and wishing them, you know, saying I'm praying for you, so on and so forth. They didn't even realize, they was like, wow, you remember. And that's because this is this impacts me um, all the time. I, do, I, I take therapy myself, I do therapy myself. So that's why I encourage so many youth to take the therapy. And when they come, when they come to these, these brothers, um, losing brothers, when these young men, come into this group, they express themselves like, like you wouldn't imagine, like you wouldn't imagine. Um, one other you. thing that Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm affiliated with is the VIP program, mm -hmm. the VIP program. And that's very important. Um, Sometimes we'll, we'll pay for, we'll sponsor some of these guys that's in the streets, that's so-called shooters or whatever, we'll sponsor them and have them go on these college tours. And in the beginning, they don't want to go. They like, I don't want to go. And maybe the first the two days, they, they don't want to be. And then they realize after they start to see people, because we, we go to a lot of HBCUs, and they start seeing people that look like them in the fitted hats and the, and, the, and the Thames and so on and so forth. And they realize, like, wait a minute, I can do this too. I don't have to be this way. And how I know that is just real quick. How I know that is because there were times that, when the youth are getting on the bus, especially the boys, yep. they're getting on the bus and, to leave. And, and Anthony, I'm, I'm going to have to get you to wrap it up a little bit. Yeah, I'm wrapping it up right now. Yeah. They get on the bus to leave. And Thank when they you. get on the bus to leave, they have their sneakers on. But when we leave Connecticut and we're far away from Connecticut, they get off and put their slippers on. And then when we're coming back closer to Connecticut, they put their, their, um, they put their, their sneakers back on. And I asked the question, why? They said, because now I can be myself when I'm away from Bridgeport. But when I'm in Bridgeport, I have to protect myself. I have to survive. Wow. That's, that's, that's deep. That's really, really, uh, uh, that's unbelievable. But we want to thank you so much for that testimony. That is, that is just, um, that's direct. That's boots on the ground. That's front line. That's understanding the thinking and the mentality of what we're actually working with as well in some of our youth. And not all of them, but some of them. And we thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Anthony. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, Peter Murchison. I thank you. And uh, thank you, Chairperson Woods um, and uh, the rest of the committee. Um, I'll tell you, just sitting here, I have learned so much and I'm so impressed with the people I've heard uh, tonight. And uh, they say uh, you save the best for last. I think you save the least for last, but here I am and it's public hearing. I just wanted to uh, speak my piece on this. So my name is Peter Murchison. I live in Ridgefield. Um, I'm also speaking as a Quaker tonight. I'm a member of the Wilton uh, Quaker meeting. And as a Quaker, we work for peace 
We believe that there is that of God in every person and that we are required to eliminate the causes of violence in our communities. And so many people tonight here have been doing that same work, maybe described by different words. And I'm just so impressed and, uh, and honored to be um, a, a part of this call uh, with you all. Uh, finally, I'm also here as a part of a survivor family. Uh, my nephew, Daniel Barden, was shot and killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, with so many guns in the U.S. and in Connecticut, um, there's not a cookie, counter, cu cookie cutter approach to address all of this. Lots of different approaches are needed, and Connecticut has had lots of different approaches. Um, we've taken, we've uh, passed laws for safe storage for extreme risk protection orders. And an aside is Connecticut still needs to publicize and educate the public on our own uh, extreme risk protection order so more people in all communities know how to use it. Um, we've also seen private groups take action all over the state, groups like Sandy Hook Promise that are delivering uh, programs in schools. These are all fantastic. But the idea of community violence that we're all talking about tonight is one where we haven't done enough. The state hasn't done enough to support the good work that you're hearing about tonight. Um, urban communities need this help. The deaths in these communities from gun violence don't get the headlines that the school shootings do. But each life lost is the same trauma. It's the same pain that lasts a lifetime. It's the same that we suffered at Hans Sandy Hook. And uh, it's about time that the state takes this action, not only to support these groups, but to make the statement that these communities matter. We're all the same. There's that of God in each one of us is the way I'd put it, but we got to take the action to do it. So Connecticut needs grassroots organizations to stop the cycle of gun violence by addressing it person to person on the streets, in the hospitals and in people's homes. It takes very special people to do this work. And that's a lot of you here. We've heard this. Um, and it takes very special organizations to fund it and foster and find these individuals. Now, Connecticut has these organizations we've heard tonight, but we got to grow them and we got to fund them. And that's what this commission needs to get done. Uh, Connecticut needs more of these organizations. So we got to find them and foster them and fund them. So I really believe this uh, in summing up that this initiative will be life-saving, just like the ones that are already in other states like Massachusetts, Virginia, New Jersey. So Connecticut, more than most states, knows what the pain and lasting trauma of gun violence is all about. So uh, my prayer and my statement and my request is for the support of this commission to get put in place and start taking action that will benefit all of our communities. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, sir, um, for your testimony. Uh, any questions from the members? Okay. Uh, we actually had one. I, I yes. just had, I yes, just had, this is Deborah. Um, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. We have a Quaker representative that comes out to all of our vigils um, to support peace. And we are. So um, just, um, you know, it, we realize how important it is for all of us to come together. And so just that representation of that, of, of that, of that sign, knowing that this is a, th this is a universal problem. Um, this, is, this is something that just not hitting one community, but communities across the board. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I thought it was last, but Pina, text me and said, we got one more, uh, the last and final individual for tonight, Harold Dembo. Harold Dembo. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can turn this camera on. Here we go. Hey, good evening. Okay, I'm from, uh, I represent Project Longevity. Uh, as Maria said earlier, uh, what Project Longevity was, but it's also a framework, meaning uh, we do a lot with people coming back in from being incarcerated, but we start thinking, how do we stop them from even going to jail? So we, first of all, first thing is we have to get strong with the community, which we have. We got very strong with the community. We work with a lot of service provider. Uh, we work with Senator Moore and um, 
Andre Baker and, and um, uh, Chris Rizzard, it's one big family all working together. So one of the things that we came up with uh, was to go to the school. So we met with the superintendent of the school. We went inside. Uh, we told them about a program we're trying to do. Um, we told them we want to hit the kids in sixth and seventh grade. Um, we started talking to them about gun violence. And what we came up with was we have the United States Attorney giving them the stats because we believe we have to educate them. So they give them the stats. And then we had somebody from Bridgeport Hospital come up and she tell them about when a person gets shot. Then we have uh, Tears of Triumph come up there and she talk about how she lost her son. Then we have uh, Sister at the Shore that talk about what they're doing for mothers um, who needs help. Then we had somebody who was incarcerated talk to the kids and tell them what it was like when they was in jail and what they're doing now to change their life. Mm -hmm. Then I come on and I pretty much tell them that we're there to help. We pass out these flyers, information on the back. If they know somebody who's been shot, they know somebody who's been, um, who needs help. If you have a gun, Project Longevity can seize that gun without asking any questions just to get it off the street. And then we let them know that um, we're there. Now, the reason why we're doing all of this is because the kids are, are traumatized. And I'm gonna tell you a short story. We did this program at one of the schools and at the end, we had a young man who was crying. So we talked to this young man to find out what was going on. And he told us that his father was selling drugs and somebody came into the house to rob them. The father ran and when he went to run, they put the gun to his head. He said he never told nobody this. And um, he's scared that the guy is gonna come back to kill him and his father. So now we're working on a program to, you know, be able to help kids who are in trauma because that's where it starts from. So by the time they hit eighth grade, after doing pilot programs, by the time they hit eighth grade, they don't wanna hear, they're too cool. They don't wanna hear about how to save them or anything. Everybody wanna be cool. They don't wanna raise their hand, but at the sixth and seventh grade, it's not too late. And we realized that me being a police officer 27 years, that's when they start really carrying a gun as soon as they hit high school. So that's what this program is all about. And it's called Fed Up Community Working Together for uh, Against Gun Violence. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Dembo. Uh, any questions from our members? Okay, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Okay, that, that, that concludes our evening tonight, but not without um, a closing remarks from our Senator, Senator Moore. And, um, and just a reminder to folks that we do have in our next upcoming meeting is going to be November 23rd from 10 to 12, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. But um, Senator Moore, if you can close us out. Yeah, I just wanna thank everybody. I've listened to all this testimony. There is a common thread. People are looking to do good work. Their heart's in the right place. We just need to get this into one place. Uh, the evaluation needs to take place. The, we need the support for these nonprofits and programs that are small starting out. Uh, Pina, you mentioned it. They need the help of the community, the academic community to be able to document what they're doing and evaluate it. The last thing we wanna do is create more programs and not have anything in the way of evaluation and outcome. And I think that's really important that we can measure the impact of these programs. And you know, we've worked many times in the past, if we, all, all the old programs worked, we wouldn't be here where we are, right? There's no reason for us still to be in this place. And I don't want two years from now to have the same conversation. So this is really important as you build the information gather information to the community so we can figure out what we need to do, how we're gonna do it. And this is a big, big project. You know, I don't take it lightly. Um, it's a huge project with a lot of components and we've got to consider all of them. Everybody's testimony here was, was uh, right on point, which says for this many people to come on and talk about this subject. We started this at five o'clock and it's, it's, it's nine and you have over 60 people who, who testified, right? This is really something that touches on all of us. And I think all these ideas are important. I've made a lot of notes and I'll share them with you to see what you come up with. But we have to take into consideration everything that people are saying because this problem belongs to all of us. And I just wanna thank you all in the way of the advisory and the people who watched in 
to say, I really do appreciate this. This is, we're on a journey. We're not gonna solve this by January, but we're gonna make some great recommendations to human services and public health on what the path should be. And I hope you'll stick with us right until we get it done. And, and thank you, Andrew, appreciate it. And th thank you, Senator Moore. And thanks CTN for, for covering uh, tonight's hearing. And thanks to all of our members on the advisory committee. And certainly thanks every, thank everyone who tuned in and those who testified or su submitted testimonies. Have a good night, have a safe night, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Andrew.